I did. You paid for it. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> the time is now 1.04 p.m. And a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of September 11th, 2018 is called to order. Marilyn, are there any individuals who wish to address the Board of Education <coughs> this afternoon? Yes, I have two people who have given me this form. If anyone else has one, I'd be happy to take it. Um, each speaker will be limited to five minutes to address the board. It is the practice of the board not to respond to comments heard during the public participation portion of the meeting. We will maintain an atmosphere of respect for all people and disrespecting anyone by name will be gaveled down and asked to cease. The public participation guidelines state that forms must be submitted prior to the beginning portion of the meeting devoted to public comment. Do I have all the forms? Okay, so the two people that I have are Gary Wanook and Wendy Zadab. So, oh, okay. And as soon as you're ready, Wendy, I'll do the timer and. I don't know protocol. Did you want me to sit or stand? Sit is fine, okay. Wendy. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I do have a handout for you. And I also want to just share my card so that you could contact me after this presentation if you have any questions. So my name is Wendy Zadab, and I am the Executive Director of the Michigan Association of Secondary School Principals. And I'm here today to really thank um, the Department of Education for making the um, really great choice of moving from PSAT, or moving to PSAT 8-9 from MSTEP at 8th grade. Um, the handout that I have for you has two sides, and we obviously have an infographic on one side. And then if you flip it over, on the other side, you see a Detroit News editorial that was submitted by MASSP's president, um, Steve Carlson, who's the principal at Sandusky Junior Senior High School. And in Steve's uh, editorial, you can see why he, as a high school principal, middle school principal, supports the use of PSAT 8-9. He also goes into this article and talks about not only why is it good for educators, but why is it good for parents and why is it good for students. So, if you get the chance or if you didn't uh, have the opportunity to catch that editorial in the news, I just wanted you to be aware that that was submitted and published. Um, on this infographic, we really wanted to just highlight some of these really positive things that are happening in the field. There's not many times when um, Brian Whiston came to our, our main conference at MASSP and he made a presentation about his assessment vision a couple years ago. And it's pretty unusual that at a conference where the state superintendent talks about assessment and change, that he gets a standing ovation. But at our conference, when he made the uh, presentation and said that he wanted to move from MSTEP at eighth grade to PSAT 8-9, he had a room of 500 principals stand up and literally applaud that decision. So why do we feel so positively about making this change? Um, this infographic really helps to lay it out for you. The most important thing really to us is that timely, actionable results. I can't stress to you what an amazing partner the College Board has been to um, middle school and high school principals in the field. The College Board does an amazing job. They have hired you know, a team of four people that are literally all over the state of Michigan supporting schools, doing presentations. Our MSTEP vendor has never done a presentation of any kind, working with districts on data, um, helping people to look at uh, those reports and to be able to, you know, make improvements. So that's a huge piece that the College Board does. That's all free of charge. The other thing that we get that's really substantial is an amazing uh, data um, protocol that we can use because everybody has their own portal. Students set up their own College Board accounts they can actually look at the test items from the test that they took. There is total transparency of the test. We never get to see MSTEP test items. With MSTEP, when you get a report as a parent or you get a report as a student, they talk about targets and claims, which basically means we're shooting at a target in the dark because we don't get to see exactly what those test items look like and what students are being asked to do. So it's a significant shift in terms of 
uh, what schools can do to make uh, improvements and adjustments in terms of curriculum and instruction. So for us, um, one of the things that has come up periodically is concerns about alignment. So I just kind of wanted to dispel some of those um, maybe misperceptions about alignment. We did a survey of our membership and we said, what uh, class are eighth graders taking in math? Eighth grade math is either below or above many students in our state. So uh, in our survey, we found that about 50% of the students in the state were taking <laughs> math classes above eighth grade during eighth grade. So that means they're taking algebra one or they're taking uh, geometry, or they're taking uh, an extended algebra, something that is beyond eighth grade math. So we really like the breadth and depth of PSAT 89 because it actually measures standards that are below eighth grade and above eighth grade. So it gives a larger range, which is actually a better measure of what math classes students are taking at eighth grade. With MSTEP, they're literally just being surveyed on eighth grade standards alone, which for many is actually behind. It's not providing that window to the future. It's just a reflection on what they've done in the past. So I have some other points on this infographic that will give you an opportunity to kind of see some of the things that are going on. But I really wanted you to just be aware that as um, secondary school principals, we're extremely supportive of this shift to PSAT 8 um, at eighth grade. It has been incredibly well received. I got a text from a principal just this morning saying, can't wait you know, to work with my middle school more closely, looking forward to this transition and to seeing things move forward. So um, with five minutes, it doesn't give us a lot of time to have discussion, but I'd be more than happy to come back at a future time and show you, literally take you into the portal and show you the type of reports we get, the immediacy of results, or to work with you individually if anyone has any questions. Thank you for your time. Wendy. And Mr. Winock, Gary Winock. <laughs> We're ready when you are. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Gary Vanuk. Um, out of full disclosure, I want to say I was a county coordinator for the Patrick Colbeck campaign. I was also the former, I was a Republican vice chairman of my county. I have resigned from the Republican Party. I don't care about that. I understand Pat lost the election, and that doesn't come into the argument that I wanted to address, which was the social study standards. I believe he was right, and the other people that had worked with him on this focus group. So I went to one of your lesson and learn sessions in Saginaw, and the first topic that was brought up was whether we were a democracy or a republic. And the guy said, well, you know, you'd have one group over here saying it was a republic, another group over here a democracy, and another group in the back that couldn't care which. It's like, wait a minute. When I was in sixth grade, I raised my hand when I asked what form of government we were. This is back in 1969. And I said a democracy. And the teacher just about went through the roof. So I says, OK, <laughs> you know, we're not a democracy. We're a republic. We're this. 75, I was in 12th grade government class. Raised my hand, couldn't remember that answer. The guy said, you're right. It's democracy. I said, wait a minute. That's not what I said in sixth grade. So I raised my hand. I said, would you please? He said, well, we used to be a constitutional limited republic. But we're getting more like a democracy. I guess the point to it is I talked to the gentleman that was running this listen and learn session afterwards, and I asked him a few questions. Because I figure if you're going to be supporting an issue, you should be able to talk to both sides. So the first question I asked him was, was there ever a black uh, speaker of the house? And he's going not to his recollection. Now, this is the stuff my wife and I use. These are the first seven black legislators that were in after the Civil War. The gentleman over here was Joseph Hain Rainey. He was elected to the House of Representatives, and you'll be hard-pressed to find it on Google. It says he was the leader of the House. Well, the leader of the House is the Speaker of the House. This gentleman was two seats away from the presidency of the United States. He didn't seem to know that. I asked him about the first civil rights law that was ever enacted 
Well, that was back in 1875. It was put up by uh, Charles Sumner, who was a replacement for Dan Webster, and the gentleman died before his law got passed. But as I laid out in here for you, you can look up those gentlemen that are on that Courier and Ives lithograph that shows them. I explain who Joseph Haynes Rainey is in this thing. Also, another prominent black historian was uh, William C. Nels, who wrote um, American Revolution and sketches of several distinguished colored persons to which were added to a brief summary of the condition and prospects. Anyways, it's, it's written on there. This gentleman was a historian. Um, they explained what history was about by um, a gentleman called Charles Coffin, who wrote several books on American history and his view of history. I asked the gentleman about, you know, because the other question came up about, you know, who were the target of the Ku Klux Klan. If you go back and you look, uh, it will say that there were 3,466 blacks that were lynched, but it also says there were about 1,297 whites, telling you that the actual target was Republicans. It was just easier to tell a black Southern Democrat from a white Southern, I mean, a white, a black Southern Republican from a white Southern Republican because they blended in with the white Southern Democrats. And it's kind of hard voting if you're not around. But the other part, we talked to some of the teachers that were there talking about the standards, was the missing of the pastors that had actually worked on the um, Revolutionary War. And I've listed you a group of them back there. One of them was actually the first speaker of the house who was Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg. His brother was John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg who happened to be uh, raised to the rank of um, major general in the Revolutionary War. There's a lot of things that are left out of our American history. My concern for our students is, is, is their lack of learning. Um, we have a sign in Lincoln looking for help wanted. And it says help wanted, must be able to count change back to customer. Um, sorry, the five minutes went faster than I expected. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, thank, thank you. you very much. <clears throat> okay, that concludes our audience communication. Um, Moving back to the Committee of the Whole Agenda, the next item on our agenda is a presentation on Spring 2018 Michigan Student Test of Educational Progress, also known as the MSTEP, <coughs> presentation of the results and the 2018-19 assessment plan. <coughs> this past year's MSTEP administration saw us move to over 99% of our students testing online, which was brought up earlier this morning with results showing both areas of concern as well as promise. This presentation this afternoon will also include a walkthrough of what this year's assessment system will look like. This is an information presentation only and does not require any action on the part of the board. We have two presenters, Vanessa Kiesler and Andy Middlestead and they will be using a PowerPoint for their presentation, which I believe we have copies. Thank you very much, and welcome both Andy and Vanessa. Thank well, good you. afternoon, everybody. Um, here we are with assessment right after lunch. I don't know if assessment is better right before or right after lunch, but <laughs> here we are. Um, glad to be here today. Uh, I'm going to walk us through a presentation uh, that covers three areas, more or less, that was explained. Uh, Vanessa will jump in. Um, with any improved commentary if I need to <laughs> need the help. So uh, we're happy to walk through some stuff. Again, we're going to talk about the results from this last spring, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in science with the field tests that we're doing, and then talk about what this year's test vision looks like that we've touched on a little bit already during the day today. So first, uh, it's been mentioned nearly 99% of schools administered the MSTEP online this last spring. Uh, when we switched to online assessment first in 2015, uh, we were in the low 80%-ish, which was an amazing start for us going from no online to over 80% online. That was incredible. And the fact that we've been able to move from there to 99% of schools online by this spring is really an amazing feat. It's really a great 
uh, testimony to all the work that our schools have been doing around technology and infrastructure and things. Uh, so that's very encouraging to us uh, on that uh, sense. We also have fast results. Uh, with the MSEP, we have preliminary results back to schools within 24 to 48 hours. And then our final results are given uh, before Labor Day each year, actually a day earlier this year than last year. So uh, that's good. We're proud to be able to do that and get that out there. And this is exciting for us because uh, as far as we're aware, no other state or system can deliver preliminary results as fast as we do. Uh, so that's very, uh, that's, we're very proud of that and we're happy to do that for our schools. And one of the things you learn quickly when you work with or supervise assessment is that if you're going to, if someone's going to tout your horn, you better tout your own horn. So I do want to echo what Andy said. Um, our move to online was very successful. Many other states, you've probably read in the news, they've had to shut it down, they've pulled tests back. So we continue to thank the field, we thank the staff here, we thank our vendors for working hard with us um, to make sure assessment really shouldn't be a big drama for kids any more than it has to be. It should happen and go on. And we've seen vast improvements in testing time, uh, implementation, all of those pieces to make it more of what it should be, which is an event that happens, but really instruction is what um, we're focused on in the classroom. So, and like Andy said, we are the only state that turns preliminary results this fast or anywhere close to this fast. We do it faster than some vendors. So, we are very proud of that. So, uh, moving on with a couple other things that we're excited about. On this chart, there's two things. On the top, there's a table there that talks about total instant report counts. So, if you see on the left of that chart, it says where we were at in 2015, it's about 9,500. Now, we're down to just over 1,000. So, that's an over 90%. Uh, decrease in the number of incident reports. Quickly, what an incident report is, it doesn't mean that something went wrong, but it's the number of times an educator or a principal has to alert us that something went funny in the administration. Uh, there's a fire drill or a fire alarm, a student got ill, something that interrupted the test itself. And really the, the fact that we've been able to decrease that much is a really a great testimony to how well our schools have uh, adopted the new assessment, have gotten used to it, they've learned about it. Uh, our team continues to put out lots of uh, guidance and training man manuals, so uh, it's really just a measure that the test was bumpy at first, certainly it was a brand new assessment and it was online, uh, but it has really smoothed out over the last four years, so that is an exciting uh, chart that we love to talk about. And the second table on here is we talk about the testing time, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about what our assessment plan looks like for this year, but since 2015, we've decreased testing time a lot uh, since that year, and that is a good thing. We agree that we want to only test as much as we have to, uh, and we've been able to make some cuts uh, through various means over those years. So uh, on the right side of that table, you'll see where we're at right now with the Michigan Merit Exam and then the M step there. So moving right ahead into this last year's results, uh, we'll have uh, three different tables, a, a math and ELA, <coughs> uh, and a social studies table, this is our English language arts table. If you see on the left-hand column there, those are our percent proficient for this school year. And on the right, you will see the percent change from 17 to 18. Um, every year, there's fluctuations. We see this every year. Every year, there seems to be points of pride and then points of places we need to look at closer. Uh, this year, we saw some increases, albeit not large necessarily, in third and fourth grade. That's particularly exciting to us because that's where we've been investing a lot of time and effort. Uh, not just as a department, but around the state in early literacy and reading skills, all in an effort to support the read by grade three law that is coming down. Uh, so we're glad to see some increases there. However, certainly uh, we're not glad to see some decreases in the other grades. Uh, we saw some larger dips in fifth grade and eighth grade in English language arts, and I'll talk about a possible cause for that in a moment. Uh, but this is what the table looks like for English language arts. Mathematics, um, nothing drastic. Uh, we see a couple grade levels there, four and six, uh, either staying steady or with a small increase. And then in some grades, uh, there's some minor decreases as well. And we, as we continue to implement the Read by Grade 3 law and the larger supports around literacy, we also are working to expand our efforts to have that, um, to include numeracy as well. So I think the kind of staticness you see in some of the math gives us evidence that we need to continue the conversation not only around literacy, which is vitally important, but around numeracy and those skills for our students. Mm -hmm. uh, mathematics, uh, we talked about that. So social studies, uh, this is our social studies table. Uh, we see some drops in fifth and eighth grade, but then a, a good increase in 11th grade. Uh, social studies, like all of our grade levels, they do fluctuate year to year. And these are the scores we have. Yeah. And certainly resolving um, the ongoing 
work around social studies standards will help provide greater clarity and direction to the field around what students need to learn and be able to do. Um, so currently, the, the former standards are in place. Um, but again, we are working, look, we've been working with the board in the field and everyone on getting to uh, social studies standards that are rigorous and help Michigan students be where they need to be. And that, I think, will, that's an important, standards come before assessments. So that's an important part of seeing our scores um, increase here. Next slide is our 11th grade SAT results. Point of note here, the changes here are total, are score points, not percentages. So we'll see here under the SAT total score um, from 17 to 18, uh, there's a seven and a half point drop. That's not a percentage, that's a point drop in the score. And then math was down 4.6 and then a little bit down on the, the evidence-based reading and writing. Uh, that's the ELA score that comes from uh, the SAT. So a couple of points about the, the numbers that we've seen. Some things that are going on. I mentioned uh, all the support the governor and the legislature and the department uh, and the districts around the state are putting into early literacy are leading to results. They're not large gains, but those scores were going down in past years and now they're going back up. So uh, I want to be excited about that and say some things might be taking a root uh, in all the efforts we're putting into the early literacy efforts. Uh, again, the legislative requirement to reduce testing time uh, that was the requirement we put into place last year for the 2018 MSTEP where we were asked to uh, cut the testing time down to no more than three hours on average for math and ELA combined. So when you make that cut, uh, we had to cut 20 to 30 percent of the assessment out to reach that testing time restriction. Uh, and we were able to do that uh, through a variety of different means. Uh, one of the things we had to do, and I'll talk about it in the next bullet, largest change happened in grades five and eight English language arts, is we had to take out the performance tasks that were part of fifth and eighth grade. They were originally also part of three through eight originally, but we took the performance tasks out of fifth and eighth grade English language arts. And then we also removed all the performance tasks out of the mathematics exam in all grades three through eight. So if you go back to the table on the English language arts, you know, if you, in, at this point, it's a hypothesis, but our biggest drops in English language arts were in fifth grade and eighth grade where we removed those uh, performance task types events uh, between 2017 and 2018. I will say, uh, this question just came up. Um, we did do a process this summer. Normally when you change your test um, to an extent that seems, I'll use the word severe, but a, a larger extent, you want to double check to make sure that you're your cut scores and your standards are still in place. We did do a process this summer uh, involving 100 educators from around the state to validate our cut scores and our performance levels. Uh, and the outcome of that effort was that our cut scores were still valid and still accurate, uh, even after our test changed uh, between 2017 and 18. Uh, so we did do that. So statistically, uh, our scores are still fitting on the scale like they should, but that doesn't account for any possible uh, experience differences that our students may have had in fifth and eighth grade. There's, there's not an easy way necessarily to do it. And Andy may talk about this a little bit more later when we go through the test changes, but while we did drop the performance test, the team worked hard to look at um, tests. Everything Sitting behind every test is a test blueprint, which kind of, like a blueprint suggests, lays out how the test is going to be built. So they worked hard to retain um, still writing components, cri uh, con critical thinking, constructed response pieces, as opposed to only cutting, they didn't just cut anything that required a longer answer, they retained some of those, and so it's still a mix of, of item types. The performance task is that longer event at the, the longer kind of separate event, but we did, um, we did know that it was important that the M-step even while we cut time, that we didn't cut time from those items that uh, assess deeper thinking, um, critical thinking entirely. Yep. And we're able to retain a long written essay in each grade level mm -hmm. because that's an important part of our standards and what uh, we want to have as part of our assessment system as an opportunity for students to write and demonstrate their writing skills through a longer essay, not right. just an, uh, an interactive online item, for, for example. So uh, moving forward to the science field test, uh, as folks have seen likely, we did a statewide field test uh, this year for science. Um, as we know, in 2015, we adopted new science standards. Uh, the science standards, the switch from our old science standards to these ones was larger than some of our other transitions between sets of standards. 
These standards are very different from our older ones, the Glicks and the Huskies, if you remember, uh, and they require a different kind of assessment. So an example is these standards are really three-dimensional, um, and they require three-dimensional items. That digs into uh, the fact that these items are moving beyond just uh, science fact recall type situations where, you know, memorize some science things about rocks and then spit back your answer in a multiple choice based question. They're actually asking students to really dig into science concepts uh, and move to three dimensions, they're called, to work through science type problems. So it's a larger change from uh, an adjust, it's not just an adjustment, it was a large change in our science standards. So uh, we moved forward with statewide field testing, and our plan this year was to field test some clusters of items, so it's portions of items this year, and the next spring we'll do a statewide field test of the whole test blueprint. Uh, so we'll give the whole test next year uh, that students should be ready to experience moving forward. So why do we do statewide field testing? It allows us to avoid double testing. It allows us to avoid giving the MSTEP science based on our old standards uh, and also giving a field test about our new science assessment items, so it allows us to avoid double testing. It also allows us to avoid creating a test that's not fully aligned to either the old or the new standards. Uh, we went this route because we're trying to learn from our lessons of the past. Uh, when we transitioned uh, from the older math and ELA standards to our current ones, uh, we, it was the MEEP test at the time, we went forward with an effort of trying to create the MEEP test that would cover both the old standards and the new standards. So it would, it would work for any district's situation. If they were eager and they wanted to move forward with new standards right away, the test would work with that. If they weren't quite ready yet, they could still lean on their old standards. And what that did is it created a unclear picture of what the assessment would cover and, and it actually was quite difficult for our schools to figure out what should they be teaching and not. Uh, this approach allows us to say, we're moving forward with building a test on the new standards and only the new standards, so go ahead and start teaching to those new standards uh, and work with us to create this test uh, as best as possible. So. Part of this I've talked about, the general test item development cycle is, you know, we identify standards. So with the science, we identified these in the fall of 2015. Uh, we've had educators around the state write and review items. Uh, we pilot test items. We've done this in the past years where we've just involved some students, some smaller classroom-based things to see how items are working. And then the stage we're at now, if you want to field test with larger amounts of students uh, that review, we get data back after a field test, and then we spend portions of our summer with educators uh, reviewing uh, our items to see how the data performed and look for bias and sensitivity issues. We want to make sure our items work well for what they're supposed to do and they work well for Michigan students. So we just wanted to take this little sidebar into a little bit of Measurement 101 for all of you who are hoping that this presentation would include that. Um, you got lucky today, it did. Um, <laughs> Every time after lunch, it's good. Yes, yeah. yes. But to um, just mostly to reassure everyone at the table and everyone listening that no Michigan student sees an item until we're really confident about what it's doing, that it's behaving well in, in the sense of it's not... Um, some of you were classroom teachers, you know, when you write a classroom assessment and you hand out the test and everybody takes it and nobody gets question three right and you reread it later and you think, well, why would any, I mean, that item is terrible. I, you know, I wrote a terrible test. Of course they didn't get that item right. You know, this was my experience as a teacher. <laughs> I don't write the items now, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, so when we, for our statewide summative assessment, we follow industry standards, best practice, research developed um, processes. We involve educators at all the stages of the process. So there's always multiple perspectives, multiple people, and there's many stages. So that by the time it's on an M step and it's going to contribute to a score that a school or a student gets, we know what it's doing as an item. Um, I just want to, that's something that's a little bit behind the scenes, so we thought we'd take a minute and, and review that component of our assessment process. Can I ask a quick question? So, so you, did you want to go first? Huh? No, 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 I just want to be sure. Should, I was just trying to say, I'm, I have a question. Okay. okay. Oh. Eileen and Dr. Z. But, but she's first. Yes, Nikki, Eileen, and Dr. Z. <laughs> So items don't ever get to students until the items that count towards a, a total score that would have impact do not get to students until you've done that process. They might have taken a, maybe a, a few questions mm -hmm. that don't count towards their total score. We just don't know. Yes. Right? The ones that do count are computer adaptive in some capacity, correct? They're considered operational, so when you, and again, right now, the science field test is happening differently. In the past, 
Um, almost every test that Michigan students takes has operational items and it has some number of items that are being field tested. And so those don't count. Kids don't know, nobody knows, but it helps us yeah. continually replenish the item bank. Um, with this, because of the big shift, when they're taking the science test, all of those are field test items right now. There's no kind of counting for the score. So by the time we have an operational test, all of those items will have gone through multiple kind of trials with, okay. with real students in for us to look at. This item worked, it didn't, it's biased. It's, and by bias, we mean you can see differences in how it's answered by student demographics mm -hmm. yeah. or has other issues. Um, it's also a matter of testing time too. We're trying mm -hmm. to be really cognizant of testing time and I mentioned the double testing. We don't want to give an hour long science M step based on the old standards and then have a student take 45 minutes of field test items. That would be a bad thing testing time wise. So we're trying to help that as well. So students have access to these items after the fact. Oh, okay. I thought you said something like that. Okay. We have access to them. So you we see how they behaved and we work with our committees and we, they go through this kind of process of review and um, it, we would, if any of you want to observe an yeah. item review process, let us know. It, we do it, um, again, we bring educators in. There's, it's really cool if you ever want to come and see. And they look at the items and the stats on it, kind of who, how, did, how many kids answered it right, how many kids answered it wrong, what are the demographic differences. There's also an element of just read it. And, you know, the old, if it asks about a schooner and nobody's ever seen a boat or a schooner or whatever, then it's not a great item because you have to have knowledge outside of the, the test to know how to answer that item. So... A lot of the criticisms of standardized testing, those are things that measurement psychometrics people work hard to think about how we could reduce those. There's never, you know, measurement is an imperfect science, but things like don't ask every kid about a schooner when nobody knows what a schooner is. We go, we have processes in place to, to try to help with that sort of thing. So yes, what, if you, any of you want to come and observe any of our review committees, now's a great time as we work through the science field test. Okay. Thank you. Eileen? So, um... Uh, I, I just, I was rereading the ESSA requirements. Uh, first of all, I commend you for reading them and taking them to heart because it's a lot. <laughs> but one of the things that it calls for is testing higher order thinking and uh, whether or not students understand content. And uh, there's mention of using portfolios and extended performance tasks, which we've dropped. I mean, we never did have portfolios, but we've dropped the performance tasks. Um, I wanted to find out uh, what those look like, at, really briefly, uh, and how long they take, and why we would not include those going forward. Uh, I, I recognize the severe limitations on the length of the test, but I also am looking at ESSA. We have a review next spring. Uh, we didn't turn in an assessment uh, uh, plan. We didn't have to. Mm -hmm. But that means that we're in uncharted territory, and when there are distinct requirements listed mm -hmm. and we don't meet those, then that's a red flag. I'm just moving away from sure. pushing off from the fact that we are in uh, triage over special education uh, and thinking, here we go again. Sure, sure. So you're asking about the difference between a performance task and what we maybe what have replaced now. it yep. with in right. a long... Right. Sure. Um, well, the exercise we had to go through last... And it was really last summer when we had to cut down the testing times. We had to look at what can we cut to meet this testing time cap. Uh, one of the things we had to do is, are there, frankly, are there pieces we could remove that would be easier to remove test design-wise? And the other thing is, we, we started in 2015 with a test blueprint that uh, we believe met our state standards in terms of alignment. We cut it down once in 2016, and we have to cut it down again. So the exercise we had to look at carefully was how many standards can we cut out of our assessment and still call it a line. Um, so speaking to the performance tasks, what those look like, uh, the performance tasks events in English language arts and really math both involved a variety of reading pieces, you know, multiple reading stimuli. So you read a uh, reading passage that might be narrative in nature and then an informative type reading passage. Uh, and maybe you have some diagrams and things like that. And then you have to respond to multiple questions about those multiple stimuli, we call them, uh, including one long written response. So it was, they were more complex and they involved more critical thinking because you're taking multiple stimuli that's coming at the student and asking them to synthesize it and then respond to some questions. 
What we're doing now, we still have that long written response like I mentioned, but it's one passage and one prompt we call it. And so you might read a story and then you would have a prompt that says, please summarize the main conflict in this passage that you read. And then the student writes an essay. So it's still a good opportunity to write and to read a good passage, but it's not quite as complex in terms of the number of things a student has to read and process before they respond to the questions. Um, but it still measures many of uh, those writing skills that you know, are important. Uh, another question we sometimes get is, why didn't we leave the performance tasks and then delete a whole bunch of the other content out of the computer adaptive portion of that? We couldn't do that because if we would have done that, we would have removed making up the number 30 standards of testing as opposed to three. While the performance tests are really robust and they're good tools, they only measure a handful of standards as opposed to 30 that you might be covering in the same amount of time in the other portions of the test. Does that help? Yeah, and I, I have a couple of other questions too, but so that's that's for that's that's the writing portion, and that happens in fifth and eighth grade. Those are, are this in all three through eight. Yep, the change. I'm gonna just jump ahead to this table a little bit. So just I, talk. Should I wait and have you do it then, or because the other the other questions that I want to ask are. Um, Maybe let's wait yeah, a few minutes. Let's do it then. Yep, uh, yep, we'll come uh, back and, to a lot and, of this. And what is a what is a performance test look like in math? Oh. Andy, it's pretty much the same. <laughs> the PowerPoint's going crazy. A performance oh, no. task in math is similar but different. You know, there's multiple stimuli that a student has to look at. It might be a reading passage. Uh, it might be some graphics or some diagrams and things. Uh, and then there still are multiple uh, questions that all tie to that same common set of stimuli. There's not a long written essay like you would see in English language arts, but there's still a, a series of questions of different complexity that a student has to respond to after they've read through a variety of material uh, for that performance type of event. Okay, then I have one more sticky wicket. Because it's computer adaptive, are you able to tailor the performance task to what you see before that in the test? So that if the you see a child... performance task itself was not adaptive. Okay. So the performance tasks, when we had them, were matrix sampled around students so that, for example, in a classroom, every student prefer, uh, participated in a computer adaptive portion of the test. And then they may have gotten, for an example, one of four different performance tasks that were spiraled around the classroom, like we say. Does that make sense? Well, and I just want to make sure that it makes sense to everybody else. Sure. So what, what, when you've got a computer adaptive assessment, which we have 99% of the kids taking right now, then you have the opportunity, if you've got the ability to write it, to if a child is being tested in math, but might be tested, might actually understand it through algebra, you can move a child up into an algebraic performance task, which it sounds like we didn't do. Or you could have. Yeah, I mean, they, the performance tasks didn't have a long enough lifespan, lifespan to do it. But I, you're right, that's a possibility if just, they were part of the. It's, it's always a possibility to try to work into the algorithm how items are offered to students, but we hadn't gotten there. Right. Yep. All right, thanks. Okay. And we'll get Thank more into some of that yep. in a little bit. Thank you, Eileen. Dr. Z? Um, I'm looking at page four there and say the social studies uh, grade five. About how many students are tested uh, in, in grade five? In grade five, there's in each of our grades, there's between 113 and 115,000 students. Okay, so average of 114,000. So this difference of um, uh, difference of three point three uh, change that's percent. So we're looking at uh, uh, three thousand is each percent. So we're looking at ten thousand, roughly ten thousand. Uh, that three point three percent change is roughly ten thousand more students who are proficient or advanced. <coughs> 3.3% of 115,000? Yeah. 3,500, 3,450%? You're trying to quantify how big of a change this is in actual students? Yes. So roughly a 10% change would be about 10,000 students. I mean, that's like a rough ballpark because it's a little bit more, but... Okay, so 1% would be about 1,000, 1,100 students. So this 3.3% change would be um, 
Three thousand. Thirty-seven hundred. If you take okay. fifteen hundred and thirty-seven. So that that percentage change represents about thirty-seven hundred students more who are proficient or advanced profit or from, uh, or I should say in this case less um, here. Okay. So I just want to get get some concrete ideas to what the percentages represent. Um, and I've been uh, I, I've shared this concern with with certain others, but uh, when we compare the, for example, on page three, the 03 percent change, um, that that seems to me to be probably less than uh, maybe the margin of error or or the variation between the classes, because we're not comparing. Uh, it's not the same class that's taking the third grade test. It's a different class, and the class itself might have a, a percent, uh, three tenths of one percent difference uh, in their native abilities or or overall scores. So, um, and I, I guess my comment is simply: let's not overstate these minuscule changes, uh, either positive or negative. I, I think we lose credibility. Uh, with the, the people who understand numbers, and they're the people we need to persuade. Right. I think that's a good point. I mean, I think the point you went to the first time is that when you talk state administrative data, when you talk population data, a difference yeah. is a difference. It, it really is. Point three yeah. is some number of kids. So you don't have to talk statistically significant. Your point about cohort differences is, is true. I mean, you, there's a lot of things in these numbers. They're just different. Point three more third graders this year were proficient than last year. Uh, we agree as well that they're not large differences, but like Andy said, two points. One, moving state test data is slow and hard, so it's, it's, not, it's not the first thing that changes. It comes later. And two, we had been seeing declines, and we saw something in the positive. So we just want to say there is reason for hope, but we are not trying to say this is a massive increase, nor are we trying to say that it is where we need to be. So hope, be hopeful, but be honest and keep uh, redoubling our efforts um, and use it to for that continuous improvement. So it's, it's a good point. Okay. I just yeah. have a question just uh, following up to Richard's uh, question. Because you make inference on slide five that the support of governor and legislature around, legislature around early literature literacy is leading to results. So to Richard's point and to what you just said, to me that we're premature in making that inference. And then I guess my other question is, is was there any thing was there anything else that was going on um you know while i support some of the supports that come that came with that legislation you know i, I don't know if i'm ready to cheerlead that legislation and i don't know that we should be making a bold statement like that and that inference just yet based on that small number you said that it we don't have to look at statistical statistical significance but then also, what are, what's the confounding factors? So you're calling an excellent question about uh, causal claims versus possible hypotheses. I think Andy used that term. Um, we are our MARI partners, Michigan Educational Research Institute, as many of you know, um, is going after a federal grant to evaluate the Read by Grade 3 law and its effects, which would allow us to more conclusively, to your point, Pam, say it worked, it didn't work, other things confounded it, it worked, these three things worked, but this didn't, which is what we really need to fully interrogate the law. So I think the point is taken, maybe we need to back our language down from is leading to results, but suggests progress in an area of focus, is, is what we're trying to say. You're right. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. it's too early to say we know for sure, but it's also uh, it's also a good sign. It could have gone the other direction. So I mean, and if you said it's a good sign, yeah. that's good. But just you know, going that but, far is a point is a taken. Leap. Okay. Are, good. are we ready to go on to the assessment system for this school year? Are we leading, on science are we leading the other? <laughs> oh, science? We can ask, yeah, we can ask at the end. At yeah, the I was going to wait at the end. Okay. Um, so briefly to finish up science, uh, oh, sorry. typically we don't provide data results on field testing because like we mentioned earlier, we don't know yet if the test content is, is reliable yet. We don't know if it's functioning right. We don't know if it has possible bias or sensitivity issues and things like that. That being said, it's really hard for folks to 
give a field test or any test at all and not get any results back. So kind of a, a compromise that we're doing this year is we are providing aggregated summary data uh, to our districts uh, based on their field test results. So they will be able to see some results based on that. They'll be able to say, well, how well did my district do on the field test data? And they'll be able to compare it to uh, the state levels and you know other possible, dis they'll see how other districts may have done. Uh, it's more of a, just a quick uh, snapshot of how they did because we don't want to give out student level data and things if we don't know yet if those items are working correctly because we would hate for anything um, high stakes to be looked at in terms of Andy didn't do well on the science field test when we don't know yet if the field test was working right or not. So they will get some aggregated summary data. Uh, then due to the field test nature of the 2018 and 19 science tests, uh, we have requested a waiver from the U.S. Department of Ed from reporting statewide science scores. We will still calculate participation rates on the science assessment because we want everyone to take it, uh, but we will not be su submitting a percent of Michigan students that were proficient in science score to the U.S. Department of Ed. So uh, that's a, a technical process that we have to do with the Department of Ed there. Now, moving forward to Michigan's assessment system for 2018 and 19. We've talked about a few of these different things uh, already today, but this chart kind of summarizes the, the landscape of the last four years and then this coming spring. Uh, so looking at the top, uh, 2015 was the first year of MSTEP. Uh, it had some bumps with it, but it went very, very well. That was our first transition to new, a new assessment, the first new assessment really in 40 years in Michigan. And it was our first time moving online. Uh, in 2016 and 17, uh, some changes uh, happened. We removed the ELA performance tests in grades 3, 4, 6, and 7, so all ELA grades except for 5 and 8. Uh, we transitioned to the, use the, uh, the SAT plus essay in 11th grade for ELA and math uh, for, as part of the Michigan Merit Exam. The SAT we use in 11th grade does require the essay portion, so we do give the full SAT and their essay. Uh, and then we re eliminated the MSTEP, ELA, and math in 11th grade. In 2015, <coughs> we gave the full ACT plus the full MSTEP, ELA, and math. So there's a lot of testing for our 11th graders. Uh, and then in, uh, we began giving the PSAT in 9th and 10th grade in 2016 and 17 as well. And we have a column here about why. Why do we change these things? Uh, really, this was a superintendent direction to reduce testing time. And we certainly agreed that there was a lot of testing going on, especially in high school. Uh, so that was the direction we took to modify that. In 2018, so that's back up to this year, we've talked about this. We cut the testing time in ELA and math in grades three through eight. Uh, and that was a legislative requirement that we got to reduce our testing time to no more than three hours on average for ELA and math. Uh, and we did that. We, after the testing was done, we looked at our uh, average testing times and we, we hit that mark. So that was encouraging because you modify the assessment and you don't really know until you give it how long the test is really going to take. So it worked out really well. So we were able to do that successfully. Uh, moving forward to this spring, uh, this spring, uh, a couple different things are happening. We're transitioning the eighth grade mathematics and ELA test from the MSTEP to the PSAT 8 9. Uh, and we're doing that as part of our department assessment and vision. And then also legislative language uh, requires assessments in grades 8 to 10 to be aligned to the college entrance portion of the Michigan Merit Exam. Also, this year, uh, we are launching the optional use of benchmark assessments supported with some state investment. Uh, this gets into benchmark assessments that have been talked about for years around Michigan. And right now what's happening is uh, part of the School Aid Act allows us to have some funds to give out as grants to our districts that might want to purchase a benchmark assessment for their schools. Uh, and they're able to apply for a grant that could be used as a reimbursement to pay for those benchmark tests. So uh, we have a wider um, bank of benchmark assessments that folks are able to use now uh, moving forward. This chart I won't read because it's got a lot on it, but this is really the snapshot of what our assessment system looks like in all of the grade levels here. Uh, K through two, we won't get into it today uh, for sake of time, but K through two is a unique place where we have legislation that requires uh, Michigan schools to take a K through two math and English language arts test. And it also we have the read by grade three law that requires them uh, to use on assessment in grades K through two to help prepare students to read well by third grade and be successful on their M step. Uh, so students or schools are supposed to administer something in ELA math in terms of a benchmark assessment in those young grades. Then looking at uh, grades three through seven here, again, we have M-STEP, 
which is not changing this year, then we see is optional those district selected benchmark assessments. Uh, and those are the tests you hear a lot about, your iReadies, your NWA MAP tests, your Renaissance Learning, uh, Smarter Balance, DRC Beacon. There's a variety of things out there that folks are using, uh, and they're able to choose what they would like and then reimburse for a portion of that. Eighth grade, as you see here, we have PSAT 8.9, which we mentioned we're switching to this year. And then we have MSTEP for Science and Social Studies, and then they have the optional district selected benchmark. And then we have, uh, as it's been through the last number of years, we have PSAT in grade 9 and 10. And then the Michigan Merit Exam still has the SAT with SA, the MSTEP for Science and Social Studies, and the ACT Work Keys exam. These are really just some summary points about what we've uh, mentioned in that chart. So the MSTEP, the Michigan Student Test of Education Progress, uh, that will be given to grades 3 through 7, the measure of student, academic, uh, student progress on academic standards in ELA and math. And in grades five and eight, that's where science and social studies occur. Um, the PSAT, eight and nine, will be given to students in grade eight to measure student progress and academic standards in ELA and math and prepare for the SAT taken in high school. And the PSAT, eight and nine, for students in grades nine and 10. Uh, and the ninth and 10th grade assessments for PSAT, those are not part of any statewide reporting or our accountability system. Uh, they are tests that are taken, and then schools and the students will get results uh, put into their, their portal from the college board and then. Uh, uh, also to the school level as well. The merit exam given to all students in grade 11 has three components, the SAT with SA, the MSTEP for science and social studies, and the ACT work keys. Changing gears slightly to talk for a minute about the reimbursement for vendor provided assessment options. These are those benchmark assessments again. District may select vendor provided assessments that meet defined criteria. Uh, and we have a, uh, a link to a fact sheet about all of the things we want to know about early literacy benchmark assessments that's on our website. Uh, and then also part of the 2018-19 State School Aid Act provides funding to reimburse these schools, like I mentioned, uh, to help them pay for a component of their benchmark system. Uh, we don't think it's going to be reimbursement for the full amount of what their cost might be, but it should pay for a good chunk and hopefully encourage some districts that might not be using these tools yet uh, to start using some. Uh, and this briefly just talks about that uh, reimbursement process. Uh, it's, it's a uh, formula grant that we've given out based on a percentage number of students. Uh, so that will all go out in the December state aid payment uh, if folks decide to apply for that grant. And then uh, in February, we'll provide a report to the legislature talking about uh, how many districts use what tools and how it worked and how well it went. And we'll do that in February. Our last slide before uh, we can take more questions, this is just a snapshot of what our 2019 test schedule looks like. Um, we've really done a lot of work over the past several years also to constrain what I say our test footprint on the spring in our schools. While there's still a lot of uh, bars up there on that chart, we really have been able to confine it pretty well uh, to April and May, um, usually finishing before Memorial Day and staggering things so that not all grades are going on at the same time. That really seems to help schools uh, be able to sort out some of their uh, computer lab scheduling and things that they need to do. So this is what our test schedule looks like uh, for this coming spring. Now we're ready for more questions. Okay, so I'll begin with Tom and then move over to Cassandra. Uh, try to go quick. Um, PSAT, we heard uh, that they can see the, everybody can see the questions. Uh, why can't we do that with the MSTEP? Well, there's a couple of different things going on. So the, the MSTEP is a computer adaptive assessment, so it has a pool of items. So, uh, and items are also very expensive. So we are not in a place where we can release all of our items because we would have to replenish an entire computer adaptive assessment pool uh, to PSAT. release those. Uh, SAT uh, is a fixed form assessment. It's not adaptive. Uh, they do release their forms for some of their administrations, which is a good thing. That is, is a useful tool. But there's also risks on that side, too, that there's a lot of test security risks and things if you're releasing forms and you don't have many forms available to rotate throughout your state and across the country and things like that. So there's pros and cons either way. Um, but that's we can't we release all of our computer adaptive assessments. We, couldn't, we just couldn't afford to replace them every year if we release them. Okay. Uh, do we use any SBAC test bank questions uh, in our, for our testing? Yes, we do. Um, how, about how much? 100% uh, of our items are from their item bank, yes. 
Okay. In ELA and math. In ELA and math only. In ELA and math, okay. Um, and I was, you already talked about this fluctuation. You said fluctuations are natural from year to year, and then we claim that 0.3 and 0.8 uh, is some evidence of some success. So I find that a little bit odd. Um, and also, if there was any, at what cost? I mean, if teachers are now having to spend a ton of time doing data observations, then maybe there's a downside as well. So, um, and then uh, I guess that's about, yeah, oh, yeah, field tests and pilot. I guess that's where some people, I mean, I, I've heard numerous times in the last few weeks, it was so bad that they didn't even want to release it. So, you know, I, I know that I'm hearing a little bit about why that's not necessarily the case, but, you know, I think, uh, did, did, uh, did field tests, when you're testing questions, do you, does it, can't it be a pilot? Like, do you have to take everybody's, you know, you, had to do, you did this statewide. I mean, do you really have to do it for everybody, or can't you get a statistical accurate result from just piloting or, you know, a, a percent? So you can, but it's very difficult. So when we, if we were just to say we want to optionally offer a science field test, for example, you know, there's already enough testing in a lot of our schools, so it's very difficult to get the numbers we need to be able to create or, or get statistically relevant data because you need a good number of students exposed to each test item to get a good data set to get some good analysis from. So uh, it was a decision in, in the fact that we want to, one, get the data we need to evaluate our test items properly, but we also wanted to start the ball rolling on our students and our educators getting an idea what this test will look like. So it provides an opportunity for them to see it, interact with these new test items, uh, because they are, they are different than what they were used to. They're not just multiple choice items. So part of it is a preparing and a professional development for educators and some uh, exposure to these types of items for our students as well. Thank you. Okay. Sandra? So actually, Tom, his first question was along the lines of what I wanted to ask. Um, I, I understand that there's a resource issue with us not being able to release the questions. But if you think about, at least originally, what the point of testing was, it's not about discipline, it's not about labeling, it's about improving student outcomes, right? And so from the student perspective, if, you know, I spent a lot of time in college, if I took a test and I got a score back of, say, 60 out of 100, but I never got to see the actual test, how the hell does that help me learn anything? Um, and how am I expected to improve <coughs> if I don't know where my deficiencies are and I don't know where I excelled. So I guess my question is, how do we communicate not only with districts and schools on a level that allows them to use test scores to actually improve outcomes, but all the way down to the student level if they can't ever see what they got wrong? So that's a really, it's a really good point. Like Andy said, there's a, um, there's a balance on releasing items, but let me back up a little. So the student does not only get, I was 60 out of 100, or I was proficient or not, and neither does the school or district. We do report claims and targets. Those help break down the standards into, I did, I did well on um, evidence on reading, and I did poorly on the research-based research component, and I never remember the four claims, sorry. But you get, and then below that, there's targets. So there's more granular information. That's what's used in, um, by schools, by districts in their school improvement planning and their instructional rounds. It's, it's a little bit of a misnomer to say I have to see the question to know what I got wrong. That helps, but the question relates to a larger target, which relates to a larger strand. So it's not about just answering that question right, it's about what concepts didn't you get. We do release sample items. We never released items on the MEEP either, so it's not just a now thing. Um, certainly if we had a very large investment of money and could have more items to be released. It's not that we're opposed, it's just we have to balance our operational constraints with and find a way to get the information out for instruction that you're saying. So we do a lot of reports, a lot of training. We work closely with our ISD partners, with our CEPI partners, with a lot of partners to get the data out and to help explain to schools and districts how to interface the summative assessment data with all their local assessment data and other forms of data in a triangulated way. Okay, but so we release this information, and yet our scores aren't changing. So something we're doing is not working. Sure. So I guess from my perspective, it just seems like I don't think the information we're providing is leading to better student outcomes. So is there a way to rethink what we're providing 
that could actually, you know, allow, I go back to my own example, if I get a test back and it says, well, you did really good on critical thinking, but you did really bad on spatial alignment. Now I have to go back and remember the test I took to figure out what was critical thinking and what was spatial alignment. I can't do that. And it doesn't help me if my professor gets that information and changes it for next year. I'm still stuck where I am. So I just think that something we're not doing is not adding up to increasing student outcomes, um, which makes me question the purpose of the testing. So I don't know what the answer is. I'm not expecting you to give me an answer today. But I think we really need to rethink what we're doing here because it, it doesn't seem to be moving us in the direction we need to go. And the ultimate priority for me is helping that individual student understand what they need to learn as opposed to what testing has become, which is we need to take over a school or we need to label a teacher ineffective and we need to do all of this. That's not the point of testing and we need to get away from that. And whatever we need to do needs to lead to increased student outcomes and right now we're just not there. So releasing items might be part of the puzzle, but I take your point about the, the diagnostic measure we use isn't changing. So something's not happening correctly around, is, is it the fault of the measure or is it that we're not uh, instructionally doing what we need to do? Is it that we're not supporting at the systems level, at the school, at the district, at the ISC? You know, there's a lot, it goes back to that causal point. So we could, let's say we released all our items and our scores still could stay the same because that's not the actual, it might be part of the problem, but I doubt it's the whole problem. And I will just use the blood pressure analogy. You know, if you go to the doctor and you, they take your blood pressure and you come back and it's still bad, and they say, it's not necessarily the blood pressure's fault, it's if you went and ate pizza and sat on your butt, you probably aren't gonna have a better blood pressure later. So similarly with, with this, we could release the item so that people understand more about the items, but there has to be a concurrent focus on instruction and leadership and support. Absolutely, so. the two have to go hand in hand, yep. but one of them has to happen. Sorry, Nikki. No worries. <laughs> so, so I have Eileen next, but I wanna comment on um, Cassandra's comment in that perhaps it is time for us as a department to look at the information that we are providing to the districts and to the schools to ask them, is this information that you are getting from MDE helpful for you in using assessment as a piece of information that helps to inform instruction and helps to inform where you as a district need and school need to put your efforts in order to improve student outcomes? I think that's the question that you are asking. Yes. Thank okay. You. Okay. And now to Eileen. And I would absolutely support that. You know, I served on the National Assessment Governing Board for eight painful years because it was a real education and it was a very informative one. Um, we faced uh, situations like this too, except for the whole country. And one of the things that I've learned is that foresight doesn't really exist when you're in a crisis. It's a great idea, but it's hard to come by. Hindsight is painful, especially because we're going to be having a review next year on our assessment plan, which, as we, I think I said already, you weren't required to submit, and we didn't. And we were restricted by the legislature in the length of time we could do. We are now looking at what S is calling for. They don't want us to just teach rote memorization. They want us, as are so many countries, moving to elaboration the ability to use information because the kids who are coming into school now have iPhones, they have iPads, not all of them, but enough of them do so that just memorizing things is not going to be what they need for the future. They need to use the information and know it well. So um, I have a number of concerns um, that I would call middle sight because I think we've been through the crucible on foresight, did what we could, and I don't want to get to hindsight. I won't be here, all of you will be looking back in potentially two years at an ESSA review that showed we were not in alignment, that we lost our eighth grade longitudinal data, that we do not have writing sorry. adequately across the state. Sorry, sorry. I'm trouble. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh-oh, I don't have to rewind, do I? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, just going forward. Oh, oh. OK, so foresight was where we were, which is we're putting together the best plan we can envision that meets the needs of the state and the needs of children and the needs of schools on instruction. What we could be in in two and a half years is in hindsight, which is out of, out of conformance with, out of compliance with ESSA, which calls for higher order thinking and understanding of content, OK? 
Um, we have some outside variables coming at us. One is that ESSA, or sorry, um, NAEP did not used to assess writing very often for fourth and eighth grade, but they did last year, and they from time to time do what's called a state report. That state report for Michigan for writing in fourth and eighth grade will be released in the next two or three months. One of the concerns that I have is that from what I understand, we now have a system that if we go to PSAT 8, will eliminate our eighth grade writing because that's a paper and pencil multiple choice test and it's never been aligned with our standards. The other PSAT 10 and, and SAT have been. So we could end up with problems with writing. We certainly are, not, are facing a situation without the performance tasks where understanding of content and the ability to show you can do it is, is a little limited. Higher order thinking is a problem. And recently I was given a piece of paper that was um, apparently the required third party study of alignment for PSAT 8 that was done in 2015 and it shows a 52% alignment to our state standards, which is not adequate. I can't tell you if it's absolutely correct, but the points that are made in that paper are exactly what I'm seeing as someone who's had that eight-year experience on, on the, the governing board and someone who's been a board member for 16 years. So the other problem is that that third-party study um, was not supported by, uh, we, we did something different this time around. We already had a contract with College Board. <laughs> So instead of running the assessment through the uh, uh, Department of Management, uh, or sorry, Technology Management and Budget, DTMB, we just did a contract extension. The reason that that's so important is the way that we migrated from ACT to SAT was because DTMB did another peer study that showed that there was better alignment for SAT and that the costs were more reasonable for what we wanted to deliver. So, I recognize how we got here, and there's no blame. It's just you know the, the fury of trying to do ESSA being that first wave, which I didn't initially support but did, and then seeing how things work out and what the distribution of the system is after we were cut back on the testing time means that we have a very different system going into this ESSA review than we should have from my perspective. And I would ask the department at this point, there's very little time. I understand the turmoil that it would create in the field, but we have a vendor situation. We contracted without, fear, without transparency. We have a report in hand that indicates that if there's not a good alignment. I can't tell you how accurate it is. I'm not a judge of that. But it's an indicator to me that we're in a very difficult situation as we go into, with this testing system, next spring, summer, having having the feds come in and take a look and say, here were our, our requirements, here's what you ended up doing, this doesn't match. And I would strongly urge the board and the department to look at turning the situation over to DTMB, having them do a second, third study alignment to see whether PSAT or MSTEP is the right test for the future, but this year continuing with MSTEP so we at least don't use the, lose the longitudinal data. If it turns out that PISA or MSTEP or PSAT or something else that I don't know about is a better assessment, then I think we should know that as a state. This isn't just about educators and it's not just about children. It's about a system and it's about how things work. But we have, the board has, a responsibility to supervise uh, and, and to step back and take a look at this. And this rare opportunity for a little bit of middle sight is an important thing because the consequences of not doing it would be significant. So. Thank you, Eileen. Um, we certainly um, are not prepared to respond to the concerns, the issues that you raised this afternoon. Um, I will consult with Vanessa, the assessment team, um, and get responses to the concerns that you have raised. So, thank you. Okay, Dr. Z. Um, yeah, I, I certainly support uh, Eileen's concerns, and um, thank you, Pam, for asking the question that I, I was thinking of asking <laughs> earlier. Um, but I wanted to ask, you know, some of these tests, like the PSAT, are originally are, are intended to be predictive. And I wanted to ask, uh, to what extent are the other tests that we have predictive? Uh, I suppose if you 
Uh, and, and I'm just curious if we have any kind of correlation if, uh, you know, st students who are proficient in third grade, do they continue to, do 99% do of them continue to be proficient all the way up the line or, or is there variation? As I look at the, the chart on page three, and I look at the class of 2015, uh, which was grade three in 2015, if you go diagonally, you see they went down and then they went up. They went down and because um, they were fourth graders and they, their fourth grade composite was down and then they, their fifth grade composite was up and then, their, and then their sixth grade composite was way down by 10 points. Um, so that I, I can't say that anything's predictive about their, their scores there. Uh, and I'm just curious, is there any insight into the... I have a couple things to share, and then Andy might as well. Um, one is the, when we talk about proficiency, it's not a predictive question. It's a question of there's this much content that you are expected to know in third grade and fourth grade and fifth grade, and did you learn, can you demonstrate mastery of enough of it to be proficient? You're getting into a cohort analysis question. So there's a number of reasons why a cohort of kids might be a chunk of them might be proficient in third grade and then less or more in fourth grade, some of which has to do with their learning trajectory. Some might do, you often see, uh, Sheila's talked about this a lot, you see cohort effects in schools um, where fourth grade is a tough grade for kids because the teaching staff or because that's the year that the transition happens or there's, so <coughs> the point is the proficiency cut is not per se predictive. It's about how much content you learned. We do look at, um, it's also meant though, so I'm going to kind of add to what I said. It's also meant, though, to signal you're on track to that eventual college and career readiness. So it it's kind of has to do double duty. Did you learn enough content, and are we, are we kind of on a trajectory where um, you, when you get to 11th grade, we have a reasonable belief that you have enough to proceed on to your career college choice? So, um, so you kind of a cohort question and a proficiency question. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that. No. <laughs> I, I guess these, part of the assumption or the question is to what extent are the fourth grade proficiencies a part of the seventh grade proficiencies? If you don't have the fourth grade proficiencies, is there any hope of mastering the seventh grade proficiencies? It seems to me that in, in that respect, it, it's, it might not be, the fourth grade proficiency might not be sufficient for seventh grade proficiency, but at least they're necessary. And in, to that extent, they're predictive of uh, I think it's a little bit different. So, so the M step is, is is a criterion reference test where it's supposed to measure what you've mastered on that grade level's experience. It's not a norms based test where you might be ranking yourself among other students and trying to increase your percentile ranking of success. The hard part in your example of going between fourth grade and seventh grade, as the example, is that you don't know what experiences that student's going to have in those years in between. You don't know if the content standards are going to change. You don't know what types of teachers they're going to have. You don't know, you know, what their overall education experience is going to be because that seventh grade test isn't a advanced version of the fourth grade test per se. It's a seventh grade test on the seventh grade standards that are tested. And yes, our content standards do compound on each other, and you you know you use things you learned in the past, but it's a little bit different than just saying, you know. If you are successful, if you're advanced in fourth grade, you have a 89% chance of being advanced in seventh grade. Right. Certainly, you probably have a good chance, but it, it's not as correlated as right. we might want it to be in this type of an assessment. Right. And like Andy said, it's really a standard. The, it's a standards question, not as much of a test question. The standards are sequential. They are aligned. They build on each other. They're more integrated. I mean, they're, they're integrated. So to your point, if you don't learn your fourth grade content standards well, will seventh grade probably be hard? Probably, um, but it's not purely a measurement question. It's really about how the standards are are built. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Nikki. I think that discussion kind of uh, piggybacks on to even Cassandra's and the concept of item release. I'm just thinking from a student's perspective, which I don't know that we've really discussed fully yet. I know we've talked about how this piece of information, test scores, would inform instruction. But if you look at it from a student standpoint and they have access to their results and understanding, a more thorough understanding of what they're missing, um, maybe it's almost a hopeless and helpless situation for them to not have access to that because then they don't know what to do next. They don't know 
and then they're at the peril of a test score that they don't understand and they just kind of sit there. They sit in that, that realm. We don't really know the students that are willing and capable or able to, to grow um, and they don't have a path or access to that. Um, they're just at the peril of growth associated with how fast we can disseminate the information and get it to districts that are going to use it effectively. And that's not really helpful to, from a student's perspective. So my concern is, what do you do about that? Well, I, of the many reasons we all wish Brian were here, I wish he were here. Because going back to the assessment vision that he launched in 2015, that was really why his heart was in the benchmark assessment, the interim assessment. Those assessments are really, when you think about an assessment system, Summative assessments are not truly meant to give that immediate feedback and the individual student goal setting that you can do from a benchmark assessment. And that's why it was so important to Brian and why now, several years later, we're not maybe exactly where we wanted to be, but we have made a state investment into benchmark assessments because those give you not only one time a year, three times, shorter dipstick, and it gives that more, that more detailed feedback. And if you remember, his goal was that every student would work with their teachers to do just what you're saying. How did I do? What's my goal setting? What are my strengths and weaknesses? How do I use this data at a student level? And that's really in the assessment system. That's where the interims, the benchmarks are better. They're built for that purpose, and, and we're excited about expanding them. So to Sheila's point, we can continue to look at what MSTEP can do along with that, but it's a, it's a both and. It's bringing along the benchmarks so they have that data and continuing to enhance our MSTEP reporting so that we can help with those conversations. So if I may interject for a moment, it really is looking at an assessment system um, that would include a summative assessment, a benchmark assessment, and then ongoing classroom assessment. So you have a triangulation of data that as a classroom teacher I am using to help inform my instruction, but my students are also using the results of those assessments to inform where their learning gaps are as well. And there's a lot of insight that students can gather about themselves. Absolutely, as and the learner. and the and the benchmark assessments not only are, can they be administered three times a year to show growth, but there's also um, additional short versions of the assessments that can be administered in between those two or three times a year. That can all be they can be administered almost monthly. That are short assessments that say you're on track for showing growth. Um, or, or here's the skill set that I taught, the standards that I taught. I want to assess those standards to see if the students learned them. I can administer a short assessment to a small group of students for whom I just taught those standards to see if they are able to apply them. And, and then the students do? get the immediate results. Isn't that what all teachers do? I mean, why do we need the state to do that? It, 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 I'm, it's, it's a tool. That teachers and that can use. Well, but the problem is it ends up being used on a scorecard because everything ends up being used what it's not supposed to be used for. No, well, we don't collect. We don't collect right, the data on the benchmark. What Sheila was just talking about was formative assessment. Right. And I'm talking about no, formative not yet, assessment. but eventually they will be if they're out there and the state's doing it. Just count it. Mark my word. <laughs> Michelle. Yeah. I. I. Um, I, I want to um, say that I, I support the goal of reducing testing, um, and I agree that a lot of the um, assessments that should be done should be done by teachers that we trust, that have relationships with the students, if they can complete something and d decide whether they are, get a passing grade or not. Um, uh, and I, so, um, so the questions that I had were, if the assessments are changing in some of these grades, how are we measuring growth? Um, and, ha and, ha and also, I also am curious to know how much money is spent by the state or the districts, not so much on the amount of time, I mean, the, the amount of time that you all have spent, which is a tremendous amount of work, but I mean, just the, the administration of uh, paying for uh, PSATs for the whole, this, you know, the either the district or whoever. And, and I know a lot of districts, they use, they pay for other assessments um, as well. And, uh, and it, I think it eats into instruction time trying to prove that they are actually learning something, but they're not being given, but they're, the amount of time that they actually have on instruction is reduced by trying to prove that they're, they're learning something. So, um, uh, so, I guess my questions are, how, how do you uh, measure growth? 
and how, given the changes, uh, and how, um, and just how much does it cost a ballpark figure in one year to, in, to um, just for the test itself and for the, you know, the uh, grading of the, the, the tests? So um, student growth is measured. We use something called a student growth percentile. Um, that would be a, another post-lunch presentation someday if you guys yeah. really want to dig into it. Um, but essentially, it's a way that allows you to talk about growth, even if the assessments aren't exactly the same. So um, it has to do with where how the student performed the year before and how they per performed the year after relative where they started. Um, again, it's a much more technical explanation than that, but it, it is assessment independent, so it doesn't require that the assessments be exactly the same to help us understand progress. I know that's hard to believe, but um, based on lots of study and how to measure growth in a changing assessment environment um, by researchers and psychometricians, it's our, it's our measure. So again, we'd be happy to come back and do a more thorough presentation on that one. So the short answer is student growth percentiles. Longer answer is let us know if you want us okay. to <laughs> entertain you with that one. Um, you know, on the money, I'd, I'd like to get back with you on the exact dollar amount um, because it's a little bit, uh, people love to ask this question and there's it. a lot of components. Um, I will say there is, a, there is state law that require, we don't test beyond what we're required to by law. There's state law and state investment, and there's also a decent amount of federal investment and federal law. So these things come in together and are used. So um, we, will get, we will get the board more detailed figures. Um, and yes, like Andy said, it's complicated. There's pieces on test development, scoring, reporting, and years, and estimates, and cost fluctuate. So we'd like to prepare a more thorough answer for the board. Okay. Thank you. Perhaps we can include that in the upcoming board brief once you have that information. If there aren't any other questions or comments, we will move on to the next agenda item. Vanessa and Andy, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate your presentation and the responses to all of our questions. Um, the next item is on the Committee of the Whole is an update from the Office of Partnership Districts. There is a new section of state law, 1622P which requires partnership agreements to include measurable academic outcomes and accountability measures. We'll be talking about that today, as well as an overview of the work that continues in the Benton Harbor area schools. <coughs> Again, this is a monthly update for you. It does not require any board presentation. At the table, we have Kyle Grant, Laura... Laura Luana Shelton, Vanessa Kiesler. Um, we have a PowerPoint presentation which is coming around now. Okay, so, so to begin, we should have also two handouts coming around right now. And these handouts were requests that you had. So one gives you the total number of students in partnership districts. And the other gives you the list of partnership districts by the round they were identified and the area they represent. So you know, like when you see one of our PSAs and you don't recognize the name, it'll say Detroit area or Lansing area. And so I just kind of made them as like a quick reference for you guys. Please take them, use them as you need. We're going to actually put those on the website as well as a, as a resource tool. Thank you. So we wanted to do a couple things in our update today. Um, we wanted to highlight a couple of the assessment results for our partnership districts from the first cohort and then talk about um, some of the programming going on, the 18-month review, and do a Benton Harbor update. So the first thing I'll say about the MSTEP results is that um, we would not have necessarily expected to see change this soon in the partnership agreements on the summative assessment. What we know about partnership districts is that many students are very far from proficient. So student, it's why looking at those growth measures are important. Students can be growing but not be all the way to proficient. Um, most, almost all of the districts in the cohort one in their 18-month review, didn't, it, they didn't focus on MSTEP as their 18-month outcome. That's their, their three-year outcome. Because again, it takes time. It's kind of the, um, this is the downstream measure that changes. Other things have to change upstream. Um, that being said, we were very excited when we looked at the MSTEP results and saw that there were some positive and, and somewhat significant improvements for some of our districts. So just to highlight a few, um, I'm going to point these out. Bridgeport-Spalding, 
uh, had a jump of 5.3% in their fourth grade English language arts and a 10.7 increase in their fourth grade math. These, as you can, if you wanted to flip back to the presentation before or the annual report, you know these are huge changes on the state assessment and really should be celebrated. Um, and Bridgeport Spalding, um, their partnership school is their elementary school. So where they've been focusing their programming, they've seen some results, um, which is really exciting. Likewise, Muskegon Heights, they had increases in almost every grade. And very specifically, they went from 0% to 5% in grade 3 ELA. Uh, and they had two-year increases in eight of their 14 possible grade subject combinations. And we call out the ELA in, uh, percentage increase to say, first of all, they were at zero before. No student in that district was proficient in ELA. Now 5% of students are. It needs to be 100%. But it's at least 5% more than nothing. And that is really exciting only a year out. And Muskegon Heights, one of the things they intentionally did as part their partnership agreement was invested in an ELA, a reading curriculum, and focused heavily on literacy K PK-12, knowing that a lot of their older students as well don't have literacy skills that they need to be successful. So again, you see some intentionality, some focus, some support from the state, and you see some early indicators that it's going in the right direction. And then River Rouge has a two-year increase of 13.5% in their fifth grade ELA and a 9.6% increase in their fifth grade math. And again, Rouge, River Rouge, and Visker is their elementary school. They've put in place <coughs> work in these content areas. And we've seen, again, these are huge increases, 13.5, 9.6, just wow. really impressive. So kudos to those districts. Um, there were other, you know, there were other improvements. There were and pieces, but we wanted to really call those out. Um, Kalamazoo had increases in, in math, grades 6, and 7, 6, 7, and 8, um, between about 4%. 3.8%, 5.2%, and 2.8%. Um, DPSCD had increases in math in grades 6 and 8, and in ELA grades 4 and 6. And East Point had some increases in math in grades 5 and 6. We do want to say, let me make sure this is next year. Um, so we are highlighting very much so the successes in these grades and subjects. Um, again, every partnership district had an increase in some grade and subject. So we, we looked at that, um, we're excited. Most had, uh, everybody had some stagnations and some dips too. So that's important information for us to go back to the partnership districts and sit down and say, wow, amazing work. And also what's going on in sixth grade? What's going on in here? You're programming in your middle school and we don't, you know, we didn't see the dips. Or you're, um, I was looking at one, your elementary school is increasing, but your middle school seems like it's dropping off the radar. So maybe you've shifted so much focus to your elementary school that maybe some needs to come back here. Those kind of conversations. The MSTEP scores aren't the whole story. Um, and again, we should not hesitate to celebrate these increases. I would, as while I take all your points about not, you know, maybe buying a celebration cake for 0.3%. 0.3 and 10, that's Right, I hear you. I would suggest the celebration cake for 5%, 10%, 13%, <laughs> some of these increases we see here. And knowing just how far these schools and districts had to go. And it has been a short, it's really been a year of programming. Now, how many of these, were any of these in third grade ELA? Did yes. you say that? So, um, I don't have my chart that I want. But specifically, Muskegon Heights, one of their increases was in third grade ELA. River Rouge's was in fifth. So, again, it's, their big one was in fifth. Um, here, let me look. Um, we can get you a little bit more analysis on and that. And if you could just send were, us what you just told us, yep. that would be great. Yep, we will do that. Um, so again, we're, we're very excited. We want to be realistic, too, and, and, and couple the celebration with the tough conversations about where they need to go. And I think it was good to get the MSTEP results right now. But really, these schools started programming officially. They were about nine months in of program implementation under the partnership model when we tested. It's just really impressive. So hats off to the partnership districts. Hats off to uh, Brian. Hats off to the team here for working in this way. And this is a kind of increase we haven't really seen with our low performing schools in a while. So I'm very excited about it. Should you? Mm -hmm. We are all excited, I should say. But I'm personally excited as well. Luana? Okay, so that being said, the one thing that we did want to ensure you, and we, you guys have asked several times, you know, like, well, how are, how are they doing? You know, where are they right now? And that has always been kind of a difficult question to answer because one, 
the, our last two cohorts just started, and the first one's only been up a year, and we just kind of feel it's unfair to try to judge that because we do have a formal process for doing that, and that's the 18 month. But I did want to assure you, just with this slide, that we are there, we are constantly, you know, uh, collaborating with them, the ISD, the authorizer, depending on um, the, the uh, configuration of, of the district. So there are <coughs> weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, and or quarterly meetings scheduled with every uh, partnership district, liaison and partners. It just varies from um, agreement to agreement what that looks like. Uh, there are regular, part I'm sorry, there are collaborative con discussions that always go on. So we have an open line of communication um, uh, between this office, our ISDs, our, our, our partners in the ISDs, uh, authorizers, etc. And uh, we continue to provide and our ISDs as well, uh, technical assistance and training. So we are constantly monitoring and, and get working up to this first 18 months that, that's coming up. Can I just yeah, to inject course. real quick? Yes, yes, yes. So I think I've been the one saying, you know, don't surprise us in three years, but I understand you're saying there's a process and I can't, we can't say definitively, but is there a sense that, you know, the culture, you know, there's positive, you know, I mean, there's, are people like, you know, sulking and, you know, does it seem like a, I mean, are they, is there at least something that says we're really rallying or, you know, we're moving in the, and I don't just mean feel good, but that is a sense of feeling that things are getting better. Um, you know, I think that you could probably judge that or at least get it from the folks that are in this, I mean, maybe just from them well, for, for um, one degree. You actually have a document in front of you from earlier today. If you look in the um, annual review, there are actually testimonials from those partnership districts as far as that that climate and culture feel of right. that you know that this has been a very positive move for them and you know they've focused their resources okay. um again tom just to assure you we are not going to wait the 36 months to surprise you the 18 month process review is going to be very comprehensive and you will get a very thorough report out of where everybody stands because there there are for some written in their own agreements consequences if they don't meet it significantly so it will not you, you we won't get to the end of the three years and it's all of a sudden like okay. oh my god guess okay. what no no we will know all along okay thank you okay. i just want to reiterate what i said a minute ago oh sorry i now so excited i want to say it again <laughs> um that you ask is there a, a positive sense i Yes, I mean across the the nine, the the eight now with Benton Harbor in their own, but they have to file a report on them. Um, a lot of anecdotal, and not even anecdotal, a lot of reporting back from the superintendents, from teachers, from the ISDs that things are changing. Kind of the process pieces are coming in place, and then again to me, and I think to the district, seeing the the MSTEP results were just a really surprising validation maybe I, I we didn't necessarily expect to see it change there so I think that'll energize but it also allows us to say hey we would have expected to see you know if so-and-so was able to get gains in da 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 you didn't get as many gains let's talk let's have an honest conversation about why I mean it could be a lot of things it could be you had to retrain staff it, there's a lot of explanations but but there is generally an energy people are serious about this people are excited about it and especially the first cohort all of them but the first cohort know that the success or failure of this model really depends on them. Thank you. Okay. Pam? So, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. I can, I can wait. I can wait. All right. Lawana? Okay. So, uh, the new legislation 388.1622P, which we just call 22P, you'll hear us say, because we don't want to say that every single time. Um, went into uh, will be going into effect uh, October one, and so the one thing that we had to do this at this last part of the summer now until actually a technical assistance that we actually have scheduled for Thursday is to one analyze all of the partnership district agreements to see if they met the three I say three requirements they're really two requirements but I say three because I think of 18, 18 months thirty six <coughs> months. And next level of accountability, I think of them kind of separately. And um, so we went through a pretty extensive process here led by Dan Ledoux in uh, various aspects across, uh, across offices and across divisions to look at what was in each agreement and if it m met 
what we interpret and put in place to the business rules around this law. And so what the law basically says, and I didn't put it in front of you and give it to you, and I'm happy to if that's something that you want, um, is that all partnership district agreements have to show, have to have academic achievement with proficiency grade level indicated in as one of their goals. They have to have student growth benchmark assessments as one of their goals, and they have to have next level of accountability of reconstitution or closure. Of that, we had 14 of our agreements that met that. They were written that way. They met, they met all of that. I'm sorry. Repeat the third one. Yeah, what was the third The one? next level of accountability. Next, so next level of accountability, if you don't make, if you don't make your... So you don't 30, hit these benchmarks, we're going to close you down. Or, yes, or reconstitute. reconstitute. Which is basically the same Haven't thing. we been down this road before? Right, because it works so well. Yeah. <laughs> right, like, yeah. Like Luana said, um, when we when we launched the partnership model, they um, they had more flexibility in the type of next levels of accountability they would choose. The department pursued a, a, a variety of options. When this law passed um, during the budget process last year, it said it's not a huge change from where we are, but the biggest change is saying one of the next levels of accountability needs to be either closure or reconstitution and defined reconstitution. That's a huge change. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can I ask you? Yes, you may. My understanding is that it's up to MDE to determine whether they've made that progress or not. Is that correct? For the, <coughs> the reviews at 18 months and 36 months? Well, to, in terms of whether they're making progress or not. That's our understanding. Right. Which is that eight, that is going to be that 18 and months, months in the 36 months, and that is actually, you know, the, the it's, it's the next slide. It's what we're working on to make sure that it's very collaborative and, and we get to a good place on. So it's still based on what they came up with, yes. right? Yes. And, I mean, yes. test scores are not in everyone, right? No, and many of them, if not nearly all of them, did not put MSTEP for 18 months. Right. They, I mean. Right, I didn't think so. I was no, just they, okay. they didn't. So like Luana said, was starting to say, a number of our, we, while it is a large change, it is not as large of a change as it could be for a lot of our districts. And so we're going through an individualized technical assistance process to go back and say, um, you know, you need to, this is the part you need to update. This is the part you need to update. And here are some suggestions about how. For some of them, particularly around the goals, the updates are smaller. If you say, if you specify it um, in a more, like you have a target instead of just a general sense, that would get you closer. But for the ones who had not specified one of the next levels of accountability that are required under this law, that's where the biggest change comes. So we agree. We know. <laughs> I just want to yes, is Detroit treated differently or held to a different standard, or are they treated the same as every other district under the under all, not just this law, but there except any the eighth UF? Except the eighth yeah. UF. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to this, yeah, not there. It applies to all. But the eighth UF applies only to them. Right. So, <coughs> in determining and progress monitoring, and this eighteen month piece that's going to be coming up, and thirty six month. We do have to look at what the law says as far as them making their target or not making their target for growth and achievement. But we also have to consider what's in the legal agreement. And in that legal agreement, many of them put process goals as well, like uh, getting a curriculum audit or, or, or instituting a new curriculum or installing the blueprint or building a plan around effect, uh, educator effectiveness, et cetera. So I say all that to say that it's not just those two pieces that will be looked at, it, the, the entire agreement will be looked at as a whole. And that was in the budget. Yes. So that's just a one year requirement, not policy. The budget bills open up every year. Right. <coughs> they would have to do that again okay. next year. year. Which one? No, 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 you're not. Yeah, no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> Are we good? Policy, yeah. it's only one year in the budget. I can tell next year. Okay. So, uh, the 18 month goal uh, goals review process, which we were calling the RGA process, which is review of goal attainment. We are in the process now of working with <coughs> Andy Middlestead, Chris Janser's office. 
our office and the, it'll probably include uh, OES, Paula Daniels' office, because we do a lot of cross-planning, a lot of cross-developing and collaborating when it comes to these issues. And so in this process, we hope to have it all in place by the end of October. We will be seeking district input. We will be seeking ISD and or authorizer input, looking at goals very individually, met, not met, you know, evidence being uploaded to our gyms, Mars, et cetera. Um, coming together a day to review in a very structured review process with a facilitator discussing the evidence that's been uploaded, looking at the business rules that were applied to determining. So when I say that, we are going to we are going to be looking at if someone put down that they were going to make 3% growth and they made 2.9% growth we're not going to haggle with that we're going to have business rules that's going to just kick it up and say yes that's met it, it, we're rounding up for the sake of this 18 month. So that's what, I, that's what I'm talking about. So that'll be a part of the collaborative process. And then what the next steps are. Because some may choose, much like Bitten Harbor did, they may choose to implement some of their own next level of accountability pieces that they have put in place. And I do have to say, honestly, very quickly with the law, it does define reconstitution. Reconstitution is replacement of 25% of staff, which is much different from our previous laws of, you know. And the leadership 50%. too, correct? Yeah, mm -hmm. but, but it was 50% in the past. So, um, uh, so that's what that looks like for the 18 month. And let's just be clear here, 22P requires, a previous slide should not have said they have to have an M-step goal. They don't have to have an M-step goal. They have to have measurable academic outcomes correct. at both 18 and 36 correct. months. Oh. So that is different. An 18-month goal could be a growth measure, it could, but it has to be measurable. It, it has to say, so it can't be only process goals or only right. um, okay. percent of teachers trained. So That's like you said here, 14 of 34 districts are already good. The other 20 are working on it. So I think the way, I think that previous slide misled us a little, made us a little more scared. Sorry. It doesn't sorry. have to be M stuff. <laughs> sorry. And again, Brian was clear, we were clear with those first nine that they had to have a growth goal. Right. They should have a growth goal, the NWEA or local right. district or whatever. We did not expect an M-step goal. So don't, let me take your temperature down there a little bit because I'm like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> measurable that's academic good. outcomes. Sorry, that's my fault. I was, I was just trying to differentiate like with just language that, you know, when we talked about benchmark, aside from, you know, academic goal, it could be various things. And that's where right. the M-step would fall. So I didn't mean to just put that as, I should put <coughs> several examples. Right. Okay, so finishing up with 22P, again, 14 of the 34 districts, uh, they met all the requirements. 20 of them we are working with, and honestly, um, I could almost probably cut that number in half when we talk about very minor. They may have said simply on their 18-month growth goal that they, their, their students were going to hit, so many of their students were going to hit the 50 percentile, which it needs to either say proficiency or grade level. It was literally adding a word of, what do you mean? I mean, 50th percentile doesn't mean that it's at grade level or, or it's toward proficiency. So they were very minor changes. The last piece, uh, 21H. So again, you'll always hear me talk about 22P and 21H and more about 21H, and that's our funding. Um, I don't have a report out on it yet because we just got those monies out last year. We are going to be looking at the effectiveness of how the money was used, uh, who used it for what, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and just evaluating that use of the money and monitoring the use of that money. But um, it was available again this year with $7 million, so $1 million more than the $6 million that we have every year. And we just opened up the window for our cohort. I, I don't want to say cohort. This round three, because they're, they're actually, you know, kind of just one thing. Um, this round three to apply. And the only reason we did that is because round one and round two have already applied and received funds. And we wanted this new and last uh, round to have the opportunity to apply. But then it really is opened up to everyone to apply. <coughs> so, you know, the funds are not there or used up and et cetera. 
Um, we did do something very cool this year, and what we're moving toward in this office is to really <coughs> automate things. So it's not a paper application. You probably didn't know that before, but now it's in gyms, and it's very easy for districts to go in and work with their liaisons and you know, say this is what they would like and this is a justification and we can go in and read it and, and approve and then get the monies out to them. So we do anticipate that the first round will complete their uh, submissions in the next few days and we will have fundings, funding in their hands by, uh, I think it's like October 20th that, that the pay, state payments are to go out. Hi, <clears throat> Just a quick update on, on our work in, in Benton Harbor. Um, uh, I've had the opportunity to be in the district three times over the past eight weeks and have monthly meetings scheduled with both the board and the CEO throughout the uh, school year. Um, there's no shortage of work to do, and Dr. and his team are kind of diving right into doing that. Uh, one of his first main goals initially, which was outlined in the cooperative agreement, uh, was to develop a district-wide strategic plan. Um, we've been supporting him in that work. Uh, Dr. Shelton was actually in the district over the weekend working with him on helping to develop some of the measurable, measurable goals and get a framework for how to develop that plan. Uh, obviously, the district budget and finance um, is an important aspect, especially this time of the year as we look at uh, the October count day. Um, the early student enrollment numbers look stable, but we'll obviously know more once um, end of October rolls around and we have a better understanding of um, who's in the district. When I was there last Tuesday, there were there was actually a line out the door for for parents and families that were enrolling in the district. So um, that's a you know one positive sign. Uh, we're partnering with the Department of Treasury to provide direct business office support. They've actually been working in the district for um, for three years now to help run the business office. Essentially, um, the district has hired their own CFO who started uh, shortly before Dr. Herrera did um, in early July. Um, Dr. Herrera has put in place a plan to address. Uh, their large carryover balances they've had in federal programs, and this is an issue we've seen in other partnership districts as well, is uh, districts have resources that are allocated to them, and they, you know, for a multitude of reasons, haven't been able to effectively utilize them in the, in the year that it was given to them. So uh, those are essentially dollars and that translates into program and services left on the table in any given year, and he has a plan to address that and has budgeted for all those carryover balances uh, in the current year. Um, he's had an opportunity to review the instructional and administration staffing to maximize the capacity within the district and ensure uh, district staff with the appropriate skill sets are in the right places. Um, the district's had four different superintendents and four different CFOs over the last five years. So that type of turnover and chaos leads to a lot of band-aid approaches in many areas, including staffing of the district. And one example um, uh, around special education is that they had teachers that were certified special ed teachers who weren't in the classroom. They were doing other work in the, in the district and with some of the challenges that the district faces in special education services. Obviously, those, those teachers are needed uh, uh, in the instructional space, so they've been moved. One of the important, uh, one of the, I think, cool and more important changes that have happened in the last uh, six months or six weeks has been um, the district centered into a collaborative agreement with Western Michigan University, um, both with their colleges of education and human development to provide support uh, for the district in a broad range of, of services for ranging from teacher prep to social emotional and behavioral support services and CTE programming. So um, they are working out kind of the tasks within each of those areas right now in terms of what the actual work will look like, but um, the district will be able to leverage um, resources both kind of human capital wise and fiscal fiscally from a university to help improve um, educational offerings to students in the district. And that concludes our update. Jill. Okay. Thank you, Vanessa. Luana and Kyle. Any questions or comments from board members? Um, I'll just say that, that I appreciate the um, the thorough uh, uh, presentation and the information actually that's given in the annual report. I, I, Tom, I, I definitely join you. Um, so you're not the only one that, you know, does not want any surprises. And being in these districts, wanting to make sure that it's very clear to them and to us um, what is going on and what they need to be doing. Because, you know, they're, those that are coming up on the 18 months and 36 months, that's, um, we just want to make sure we get it right. So this information that you gave us in this annual report is, is very helpful. Um, and so as we talked about the, the, during the previous conversation, we made inference and, and gave credit to, to some markers, to a marker being moved. Um, 
when we address these outliers, that's going to make huge impacts on those numbers. So, Great. you know, just keeping keeping that in, in mind. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate your presentation and responses to questions. Okay, moving to the regular meeting, we have the approval of the State Board of Education minutes. May I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of August 14th, 2018. So moved. Support. Is there a second? Support. Discussion? I have three Michelle? changes. Oh, I'm sorry. No? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Cassandra. Um, no, no. Three quick sorry. changes on page 10, the last paragraph. Um, no, I'm sorry, <coughs> page 11, uh, the second paragraph, it says, I participated in the Detroit Urban Summit, participated in should be changed to attended. Um, then uh, page 10, uh, it says, um, Dr. Albridge asked if student choice students to forgo instruction. I think that's supposed to read, asked if student choice students um, are allowed to forgo or can forgo. Uh, it doesn't read correct. And then the last one is on <coughs> page 13. Um, I believe we're missing under... The third paragraph, uh, Dr. Albridge, I think it's, it's supposed to say said the draft state superintendent job description. It's missing a word. Okay. We will make those changes. Any other discussion? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Moving on to the reports of the co-presidents. I will forgo. Okay. Um, I had three items. First off, I wanted to acknowledge uh, not only 9-11, but uh, in many uh, schools uh, and places, uh, Michiganders are observing Patriot Week, which begins with the 9-11 uh, and ends with the uh, anniversary of our Constitution of 917. It is well to remember these important things are the values that we hold in common, as Americans, and 9-11 grimly shows that um, uh, we will, as Benjamin Franklin said, either hang together or we will assuredly hang separately. Secondly, uh, last month I was uh, nominated for the third time to the State Board of Education, and I deeply appreciate those who supported uh, my renomination. Uh, the Rep State Republicans also nominated Tammy Carlone, of Novi and uh, God and the people willing, I uh, hope to be able to serve with her in the new term. I also note that uh, Michigan Democrats nominated Judy Pritchard, who has been a frequent visitor here with us. I had a class uh, under her about 15 or 20 years ago in uh, Macomb ISD and uh, have admired her character and her professionalism ever since. I think she's an excellent selection. Um, and the third thing I wanted to mention is I was honored to make a visit with the Assistant Secretary of Education, Frank Brogan, sometime uh, teacher, principal, Florida Lieutenant Governor, and now Assistant Secretary of Education to the Clintondale Schools, where we were hosted by CEO Greg Green and given a demonstration of their flipped or reverse classroom uh, procedure which they credit with uh, remaking their entire school culture and lifting them from uh, the dregs of the uh, state scores to uh, much more respectable progress. Uh, so we want to thank uh, both Assistant uh, Secretary Brogan for visiting Michigan, honoring us with a visit, and uh, CEO Green for sharing uh, their wonderful uh, <coughs> accomplishments at uh, Clintondale Schools. Can I just add, yes, since of course. we mentioned candidates, I don't want to forget Tiffany Tilly was also nominated by the Democratic Party, and Sherry Wells is here who uh, runs is yeah. running on the Green Party ticket. Green Party. Okay. 
Thank you. So we'll move to the um, report from the interim state superintendent. I'm just going to briefly highlight three items today. Um, during the August 14th State Board of Education meeting, I indicated that I would contact the Attorney General's office for some guidance on how to proceed um, following the board's four to four vote on the statutory criteria for the competitive grants that are part of the Marshall Plan for Talent. I did receive written divisional level advice, which I did share with all of the State Board of Education members. The advice requires MDE to carry out our statutory re um, responsibilities, which we have begun since receiving this information. Also during the same board meeting, um, board members requ requested that we provide a guidance document for the grant application uh, competition. Uh, we used the feedback that we received from the board on August 14th to draft a guidance document, which we sent to the board for your feedback, your suggestions, your input. Um, we have not received anything as of today, so we would like to extend the courtesy to you um, to please send us your feedback by Friday, September 21st. So if you have feedback you'd like to provide to us, Please send it to Wendy Larvick by Friday, September 21st. Um, if you need me to, I would be glad to resend that guidance document to you electronically so you will have it readily available. Um, I'd also like to um, comment that we had an error in the pupil accounting manual um, related to enrolling students in cyber schools, um, which we cleared up as soon as that error was brought to our attention. Section 553A requires cyber schools to provide 1098 hours to students and that students have to participate in 1098 hours in order for the cyber school to receive state aid for that student. The pupil accounting manual has been updated to reflect this uh, language change and provide clarification. We've sent a communication to the field um, with the language change as well as a link to the People Accounting Manual where that change has been posted along with some additional clarifying information. And then, yes, Dr. Z. Pardon me, but um, now was the, uh, was the accounting done in this erroneous manner last year? No, it was done this past year. For this year's People Accounting Manual that was issued August just okay. last month, August 1st. So did that represent a change in accounting from last year as opposed to what's going to be applied this year? It what was reported was a change in how it was student pupil membership was going to be counted, but it was in error. So the information presented said that Students had to participate for 1098 in order to receive state aid, and that students could not enroll unless they were going to participate for 1098 hours of instruction. Mm -hmm. And we remedied that and said that state aid will be allocated for students who participate for 1098 hours, but a student can register and enroll in a cyber school at any time. Okay. Um, and was the policy implemented last year uh, different from what's being implemented this year? It will not be, no. Okay, that's what I wanted to... So policy, words, policy will be the same from 1718 to 1819. Okay. Okay. It was simply um, an interpretation of language that was in the pupil accounting manual that was incorrect, that was corrected once we found out about it. Okay. Thank you. And then my last item is a really exciting item for me because from September 23rd to the 30th, I'm going to be in Taiwan <laughs> to sign the Memorandum of Understanding for the Teacher Exchange Program. This is an exchange program that brings language teachers to the United States, to Michigan, and um, Michigan teachers to Taiwan. So very excited because this is my first time to Asia. So I'm very excited about it, and I look forward to sharing my trip with you when, um, during the October State Board of Ed meeting. And that concludes my report.
We'll move on now to the report of the Teacher of the Year. And we welcome Laura Chang, our 2018-19 Michigan Teacher of the Year. Um, Laura is a K-5 reading and math interventionist at the Vicksburg Community Schools. And I believe, Laura, you have some a report that you are going to be sharing with us this afternoon. Yes, and with your permission, I'd like to invite Gina down to the table to join me. So I'd like to illustrate today what competency-based personalized instruction should look like in an elementary classroom. It shouldn't be rows of students staring at a computer, but students engaged in work specific to their individualized needs. So the, er, this question was commonly heard in my early years of teaching. Um, students were lined up in rows in the classroom 18, 20 years ago. <laughs> Teachers would deliver the content from the front of the room while the students listened quietly at their desks. When the, after the content was delivered, the teacher would pass out the worksheet around the room, and by the time she got to the last student, the first student had raised her hand because she'd finished, and she said, I'm done, what do I do next? Today, the effective elementary classroom should be much more vibrant and active. Walking into the classroom, a visitor might see a group of students huddled around a teacher in one corner. In another corner, a group of students are around a computer working collaboratively. There might be students reading independently and taking notes. There might be students um, engaged in partner activities. It's loud. It looks chaotic walking in from the outside. However, all students are actively taking charge of their learning, and they're finding ways to exhibit their new knowledge in real life ways to their classmates and their families. Kids in these classrooms are excited to learn. They're excited to show what they know. And they're able to use technology to collaborate with their peers to, um, use, to practice their, sol their problem solving skills together. So the first step in creating this personalized, differentiated classroom environment is working with colleagues to identify priority standards. At the second grade level, there are more than 40 Michigan standards in English language arts and over 25 standards in mathematics. Those, the vast majority of those 65 standards also have specific substandards as well. Also, elementary teachers need to balance their day with the demands of science and social studies and handwriting and social skills and PE and the arts, all of those wonderful things that we squeeze in. There's just not enough time in a school year to teach every standard for ma to mastery. So we've worked in Vicksburg, in my district, to collaborate with grade level teams, as you see here, to identify priority standards. This, I want to be really clear, this doesn't mean that we don't teach every standard as prescribed by the state. That's not it at all. Instead, we carefully identify the overall goal of the content that will prove students have mastery. So by identifying these priority standards, we can provide opportunities for students to dig deeper into fewer standards rather than just quickly cover at a, at a surface level a wide variety of standards. Every student, every student has academic strengths. One student might read stories with fluency and expression, but may not comprehend the text. Another student might be able to solve two and three digit addition problems, but they might not understand the difference between 2D and 3D shapes. So before beginning work around a new priority standard in the classroom, the teacher needs to assess students' knowledge of that standard to determine which student needs which instruction. There is no one size fits all approach in a classroom. If a student has already mastered the content, they've got to be given opportunities to work on content that they have not yet mastered. Equity is not everyone getting the same thing in your classroom. It's allowing students to move on to something new when they're ready, and it's revisiting content with students who need additional support. Equity is giving every student a fair chance at success. Differentiated instructional groups are then developed based on that data. For example, the teacher might identify a small group of students who struggle in reading comprehension and need additional supports to master the grade level content. She meets in a guided reading group with these students daily to scaffold their learning and provide guided practice with grade level text. Around the room, as you can see here, groups of students are also developing reading comprehension skills by digging deeper into text that they have read independently. 
one group of students that you can see in the bottom left there, that group of students is programming an Ozobot, a little a small robot to retell a story. Other students are creating a book review on Flipgrid. I want to show you a, just a quick little snippet of that. Um, this is my favorite book. It's from Ninjago. It's called Ninjago Masters of Spinjitzu, The Titanium of Ninja. I highly recommend this book because it is so cool. And actually, Jade Blue Ninja is in my class. Let me find my favorite paint. So he's about to um, provide evidence from the text, which um, describes exactly why he would recommend that book to his peers. So uh, other students are spending this time reading independently. Um, some students are writing a persuasive letter to their pen pal across the, st the state, persuading them why they should read the book that they just read, providing details and examples from the text. In this way, all students are exhibiting their learning in a wide variety of ways to their teachers and classmates while not working on the same activity. Every student has a chance to work at their unique individual level while moving toward a common priority standard in reading <coughs> comprehension. In an effective classroom, this does not mean that a student is working on a program on a computer. Instead, students are immersed in projects to dig deeper into the content and extend the learning beyond the confines of the grade level curriculum. Oh, there's Brody again. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Differentiated, personalized learning is not just for students who are struggling with the academic content. Students who are working above grade level also benefit from this type of instruction because they're able to push ahead while teachers continue to teach and reinforce the grade level content to the students who need it. Teachers meet with students to examine their data, set goals for learning, and track the data based on formative assessments given throughout the unit of study. When students take ownership of their own data, they're able to share their progress with classmates, teachers, and families. This is a picture here of a student-led conference. In Vicksburg, kindergarten through fifth grade students lead one of their two parent-teacher conferences in the school year. They know their data, they can explain it to their families, and they're motivated by it. The same process continues with potentially all of the grade level standards. At first, the thought of personalizing learning to this degree with every standard is overwhelming. And it's okay to start, to start slowly, though, to create that environment that fosters strong, independent, engaged learners. Now, I'd like to um, pass the mic very briefly to uh, Dr. Gina Pe Pepin. She represents Region 1, which is the entire Upper Peninsula. And she's going to take just a few minutes to share a few points specific to her region. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me a few minutes to just share with you kind of my plan, my action plan for Upper Peninsula. As it was noted earlier that we, we really need to retain and recruit and get some diversity up in the UP. We, um, we had some struggle with filling some positions, um, even this current school year. And I think there are so many amazing teachers out there right now that if we can just get people to celebrate and recognize and create some networking systems and some different things up there, that we can get them more involved at this level as well. And so um, that's a big part of my action plan, and I'll just... So... <clears throat> just really want to focus on elevating and celebrating um, the educators that are there right now and getting them to connect with one another across a pretty large region, working on outreach and networking nominations and different type of recognition for these folks. I had just previously shared this weekend the uh, nomination for the Michigan Teacher of the Year link and just saying that anyone can nominate a teacher from the you know Upper Peninsula parents. And I already had gotten seven emails and texts within that was two evenings ago. So that to me is really exciting to just be able to build that capacity up there. I think just working on identifying what those barriers are and what our needs are so that we can um, change perceptions or at least clarify some things where I know a lot of teachers have said to me, oh my goodness, but it's so far away to come to Lansing and have to participate in these things. And um, in all reality, because of everyone here and MDE, I flew in last night after, after I taught. So, 
and I can fly out tomorrow at 5.30 a.m. and walk right onto my school by 10 a.m. So it's doable. So being able to share, you know, the structural pieces that we can do this and we can make this work. So I'm hoping to recruit and um, be a big part of that as well. Um, again, some local incentives. Someone had shared with us last year when we, Laura and I were both um, some of the remaining members for the Teacher uh, Advisory Council, how in Detroit there was an incentive for 50% off mortgages. I'm going to be visiting a lot of people in the UP, I think, throughout this year to see what we can build for those local incentives as well, because there, there are, there's a great, um, there, there's a great advantage to being in a small community. And I know that some of these businesses and these local stakeholders have the power to do things like that. So that's part of my plan as well. And I just wanted to share with you really quickly that um, we are just in like this almost second week of the Leader and Me. We are one of we are the first UP school to actually start incorporating this, and I can already see a cultural change. And I know Laura's school had what year are you guys in? Year three. Year three. Mm -hmm. I'm ecstatic to have this up here, and I think it's really going to do just some promising things. And um, it's also going to, I think, provide to teachers who we all know directly impact those students just some some additional resources because as a third grade law and all those other things are here we've we focus on we focus this year more on behavioralists in our schools rather than reading specialists and we need to be able to provide supports for um, all of our d diverse students up there as well so I just wanted to kind of share that with you and I know Northern Michigan University is working on some creative ways on getting um, some of those career pathways established in grants and different applications, even free courses, to help build more teacher capacity up there as well. So thank you for allowing me to share that. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gina, and thank you, Laura. Appreciate your report this month. OK, the first item of today's discussion action agenda is the discussion on state superintendent search. And I believe our co-presidents Richard Ziley and Cassandra Aldrich will lead this discussion. So I am passing around three documents. Uh, one is just a reminder of our timeline. And I am happy to report we continue to be following the timeline. Uh, so we are right on schedule. <laughs> the second thing that I am passing around, uh, there are two documents, they're the same thing. One is a red line uh, with the superintendent job description and the other is the clean copy of um, the job description, assuming all of the changes have been accepted. As you know, we put this out for public comment last month. We received two uh, comments back. And as a result of that, we made a few changes to the job description. And in addition, uh, we also made a couple of adjustments, uh, one being moving the Michigan Constitution language up to the beginning, uh, since that really doesn't fall under roles and responsibilities, uh, but is more uh, general description. And then the other thing that we changed is we removed the priority order ordering from all of the uh, credentials, skills, traits, and experience um, as uh, I don't think this was a holdover from the last. And we as a board didn't discuss um, prioritization in this manner. So I figured we could just remove it, and then it wouldn't be uh, necessarily an issue for us. And Richard, I think you had one change as well, correct? I simply um, uh, knowledge of technology, I you know uh, it was like extreme knowledge of technology, and I just thought that was ah. not. Okay. Um, so with that, um, we're submitting this for uh, discussion and um, hopefully approval this month. Uh, but if not, we still have time for next month as well. In addition, I will just say that um, Deputy Superintendent Grant met with the DTMB a couple weeks ago, and uh, we believe that the RFP will go out Will be, this week? It will be posted no later than Friday of this week. Yes. So that, too, is, is on schedule. Okay, so we will begin by having a motion to approve Michigan State Superintendent job description. To support. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Discussion. I guess, so how, yes. 
Yes. Tom. How exactly would um, so when we hire the firm, they'll use this to include. I mean, they'll they'll use it to publish, but then will they use it to include and exclude candidates? Well, so I can tell you what happened last time. Uh, so candidates, they have to bring all the candidates to us. Okay. They cannot exclude right. the candidates. Okay. Uh, the candidates can ask for confidentiality, in which case we can go into executive session. Okay. If a candidate does not ask for confidentiality, then we have to discuss them in open setting. Okay. But uh, my understanding from the last time is they are not permitted right. to withhold okay. candidates from okay. us. Okay. So, okay, so it could be 40 or 50? Last time it was over 50, yeah. Okay. But only one wanted to be in public session. All the rest of them asked for confidentiality. And you guys? In the first round. And you all did 49 different? Well, we relied on the uh, search firm to give us recommendations from those. And I think what they did is narrowed it down to about 15 that they thought met the criteria we were seeking. And then we discussed those 15. Well, we first of all said, yeah, we think you're right about the other ones. Uh, and then we started doing a deeper dive into the 15. But only one was the public Correct. name. Correct. Uh, yes. And so what we did is we gaveled in to a public meeting. Uh, we said, does anyone have anything to discuss about this candidate? Okay. Nobody did. We gaveled out. Okay. So if we don't, if somebody applies uh, that isn't 100% in line with this, we can still choose them. Sure. Yep. Right. Yep. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's one of the things that I would love to see if some is someone who's knowledgeable of and supportive of a whole child approach. Um, That's interesting. Is there in there? Oh, yeah. in there Just well-rounded education, not really. I guess not. Full. I guess when I think of the whole whole child, whole child I think of um, that a child is uh, healthy, <coughs> safe, engaged. Uh, I think, uh, and, and the reason why I think about it is because we understand more and more um, the connection between the health of a child and the educational outcomes, and we've learned that more here in Michigan than any place else. So under number eight, would you like to add a third bullet? Because it's Michigan specific. I'm, I'm wondering if it might belong under three. I'm thinking yeah. seven. <laughs> okay, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Seven needs another bullet point. I think three, to me, three, it puts under, it puts better under three, but I won't argue uh, as long as it's there. But I, I do think that it fits under three. Can you recommend us? I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was getting ready to look through here to see if there was. I thought that there was some. I saw some language. I don't know, Kyle. You have any thoughts on that? Um, Use an educational round, please. I'll take it more. Maybe support. Concern for the whole child. Or understands the importance of providing supports that meet the needs of the whole child. I like that. Ooh, I'll go with that. I think it's good. Mm -hmm. Understands the importance of providing supports to meet the needs of the whole child. Like the whole child approach or something. I'll just say, as I think Richard has also said, as long as it's understood that there are concerns of mission creep when it comes to that, um, knowing that this is not exclusive, it won't exclude anybody. I'm fine with including that. Any other discussion? Okay. All those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. 
Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. We now have a job description for the state superintendent position. Okay, moving on to the next item on today's agenda, it's a now moving back to the approval of the extension of the moratorium on Educator Preparation Institution of Michigan. So earlier today we had a presentation and a discussion on this topic, so now we will move to a motion to approve the mor moratorium on education preparation institutions. So if you don't mind, I will read the um, motion, recommend that the State Board of Education approve the extension of the moratorium on new educator preparation institution approvals for three years, October 13, 2018 through October 13, 2021, as described in the superintendent's memorandum dated August 28, 2018. Is there a motion to approve? Well, let, let's just make a motion and then we approve it or not. Okay. So for so the that's purpose of discussion, I I move. Okay. The Second. recommendation. Support. The, and now discussion. Yes, Cassandra. I would suggest we need to modify this um, because we do have shortage areas in certain uh, area, not geographic and position-wise. And if there are institutions that can satisfy some of those shortages, I think we should not limit them from being able to do that. Um, I would also, I, I don't know if this is feasible or not, but I do think that we should treat alternative and traditional in a very similar manner. I don't think it's, it's necessarily fair that we um, create moratoriums on some and then we treat alternative forms differently because that is suggesting, in my opinion, that we are um, believing that alternative forms are somehow superior by not having them treated similar. Those are just my two cents. Okay, Dr. Z? Yeah, I'll make it four cents. <laughs> uh, I, I, I agree with several of your concerns and um, uh, my own uh, my own thought is that lifting the moratorium does not convey rights to organizations or groups that may have an interest in establishing a program. So lifting the moratorium does not obligate the department to spend a lot of time justifying a refusal. That's what I'm saying. On the other hand, I, you know, if, if someone has a creative program that they want to uh, develop, um, I, I, I guess we'll trust the professionals in the department to whether there has whether there's merit or refer it to the board if if they feel that it's uh, uh, they need um, a decision one way or the other. But I, I think that uh, I, I would like to see the moratorium lifted and um, without tying up the department in um, but without necessarily implying rights to other to schools or 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 groups that may want to uh, establish a new program that, that the department is not convinced has merit. So I hear, so, so far I hear that there are two board members for considering removing the moratorium. No. Modifying. The Modifying, the so that would be having a selective moratorium? Yes. Okay. I, yes, Tom? I guess I just, uh, yesterday in the Detroit News there was a article with the headline, Michigan School Districts wow. Battle Widespread Teacher Shortages. And um, the executive uh, director, uh, who we heard during public comment of the um, state superintendents talks, I mean, I don't want to talk, uh, maybe I'm summarizing wrong, but it seems like everything. I mean, a lot of stuff, special ed, world languages, math, science, ELL, that there's a lot of shortages. Um, and, uh, you know, I. I don't know how selective we need to be. It sounded like it takes a while to get these things going, but I guess, uh, and the problem would be is they could get going and then all of a sudden, uh, well, I guess they wouldn't revoke it once they're getting going. But I just, I personally just wouldn't want to see any, um, any you know, withholding of competition. And who knows why somebody may choose one program over another. I mean, Waterford just hired, four, Waterford schools just hired 45 teachers and they're still short 45 after that hiring in Farmington Hills, 25 teachers short. So I know there's a, a lot, I hear it, I think there's a shortage. So I don't, I don't know that we should just uh, 
I don't know if it's going to get better by the time these these schools come online. If there's a couple of them that are going to come online, but I think we ought to withhold it. I don't know if today we just need to give a three month moratorium. It sounds like there's some that want to modify, some that may want to totally lift it. I think I don't know if there's a majority that just says we don't want to extend it for three years. As is. Okay, Pam and Eileen. Eileen. And, you know, I, I really don't know how we address this, but, you know, for me, I'm when I'm, I was trying to listen intently and, and really pay attention to what the purpose of this was. And we talk about shortage and we talk about shortages in some areas. I read the article um, that was in the newspaper yesterday, but I live every day looking at, you know, we're not talking about shortages. We're talking about the house is on fire. There are not teachers showing up and kids are sitting in being stored in places until someone can come in that day and and provide um, um, help to that to that school. So um, you know I don't know how that that translates into um, altering this or having some sort of modified um, moratorium. But I guess I'm, I'm I'm really trying to follow, and it's really difficult for me to to follow what it is that we're trying to do here. Eileen? Uh, so we're trying to balance a bunch of different things. We've got geographic and subject area shortages, which means that, you know, you, we can't get teachers up into the UP. And, and what was the quote yesterday in the Detroit News? He's not going to let the UP superintendent won't let his physics teacher retire. Thank you very much. I mean, that makes sense to me. Uh, but the reality is that uh, we're also producing more teachers in disciplines that we don't need than we're able to hire in the state. So to me, this is a pinpointed effort to uh, uh, recruit, educate, and retain teachers in geographic and subject area shortages, for sure. And uh, Vanessa talked, um, has talked repeatedly about trying to bring kids through middle school and high school wanting to become teachers and understanding what it means. And that's really important. And then the whole mentoring piece, everything that was discussed today, the educator prep, those are all bits and pieces of the puzzle. That's what we do. We supervise educator preparation of the state. It's the only aspect of post-secondary that we have control over. So opening it up and letting it be a wild west of competition makes less sense to me than saying, guys, you know, it's a, it's a different world at this point. We have to. We're seeing results from this careful educator preparation. We're seeing it with kids at risk, and we need to continue on this path. Who is not doing certain things already that we need who can join us. So I would be very interested in a three-month moratorium and any reflection you can give us on whether there are dis or whether there are uh, uh, colleges and universities who, for example, Hillsdale, would they be willing with their student emphasis to partner with uh, Grand Valley, which is doing a good job of educator preparation, or another institution that we feel is on top of this and all over it? That's one possibility. Another one is, are there um, uh, uh, teacher prep programs or institutions like Davenport who want to extend their alt route into a comprehensive program if they're already understanding what the goals are. Um, a subject area and geographic area, what can Northern Michigan do more? Is there some way to make this work for the areas that are really struggling? Because just to produce more L ed teachers who are going to go out of state. Um, makes less sense to me with the, uh, the problem is that we have this responsibility. So you have limited capacity. It's, it's finite. And if we stretch you too thin, then we're not going to make the progress that we could be making with the rest of the, of the EPIs. And I see that clearly, and I don't want to say suddenly, let's bring on 30 more. That's not going to solve it. The real question is who can step up to the plate? Are there institutions out there that are thinking about this? and would want to do something. So I would be in favor of a three-month moratorium extension with, if it's possible, to get more data from you folks, from staff, to say, here's what might be possible. I Vicky, just have a and quick question. Is Michelle. the alt route um, desirable and effective for those areas that are short of teachers? So uh, that's a big question. Um, and Leah can talk more about this. Um, due to our law, alt routes actually cannot prepare special education teachers, and they can't prepare career tech education teachers. 
The alt routes will not help with those shortages. That would be strategic expansion by certain ed, it'd have to be at prep physics, institutions. but for, yes. for example. So, um, so are they effect, now the second part, are they effective in other areas? They are primarily located in um, urban areas, hard, you know, hard to staff districts. None of our programs are mature enough for us to have um, conclusive effectiveness or non-effectiveness data. So we can tell you about where they are and who they're staffing, but we don't, they're all new enough that they're still in their, what we would call their um, uh, preliminary program approval. Mm -hmm. Because again, the law steps out that they get preliminary program approval and then they have to submit a certain amount of data and then if they meet certain criteria, they get full program approval. So I can't answer your ultimate effectiveness question or like what, are they good overall? Are they, they are currently helping primarily with urban areas. Are they effective at that? We just don't have an answer yes or no. And they can't meet some of our shortages in special ed and CTE because we, uh, uh, our law does not allow that. Okay, Michelle? Um, so, you know, I, I hear that there's more teachers produced, but there's still massive shortages in particular areas. Um, so I don't think the issue is the moratorium or not the moratorium. I think it's the issue is why are teachers leaving and why aren't they staying in the profession? And um, I'm not sure a moratorium or not a moratorium. And um, although I tend to think of more strategic way of trying to get the teachers we need is um, something worth considering. I, I really think until we just look at the hard truth of why teachers leave or in, a, in the high, high turnover, especially in the first year or two, uh, first five years that they leave the profession, um, is low salaries, especially for entry-level teachers that are frozen at those steps. And, um, and I, I think also a lot of the um, disrespect and blame for, from everything, from too many people in prison to, uh, you know, to whatever, not competing well with... Uh, you know, uh, some other country that has a totally different system. Um, so it, it's, uh, I, th I think, um, looking at the teacher shortage um, is, is really important, and we should probably grapple with that. But I'm not sure having more prep programs is going to solve that pro problem. I think we have plenty of seats available now. I know a lot of them, a lot of the schools are doing online, more online courses, so people can have more flexibility and be in different places. And um, their, their um, enrollment is just plummeting and uh, to the point where some are closing. So I, I um, uh, that said, um, I think, I, you know, I would, if we're going to look at, at, at uh, considering a moratorium, I agree with the extending it for three months. Looking strategically, I know it's beyond the scope of what you're discussing with the moratorium, but we should at some point have a real uh, discussion about what we can promote to really keep teachers, retain teachers, um, even if it, we don't have the power to make it happen, but at least to make recommendations on what we think should be done to, to keep them. And I um, thank you for that comment. I would um, just like to, uh, I appreciate the board talking about this decision in the larger context of the whole educator pipeline. Just to remind uh, or to reiterate our logic of bringing it here was not about shortage or not shortage. It was about ability to support the current institutions in uh, offering high quality programming to the candidates we have. I, we will reiterate that we believe that the shortage issue is not solved by the yes or no to this. That is a separate issue. And Michelle, you just uh, completely articulated it. Recruitment and retention are the two pieces that we have to have a lot. So more, I think you said it well, moratorium, not moratorium. And again, thank you, board, for discussing it in the larger context. But we don't think this has a direct impact on shortage. We think it's a different, a, our rationale is different. There's a point of data that might be interesting for the board. Several years ago, we pulled the data to see how many teachers in that had valid teaching certificates his last known address was still in Michigan and were under the age of, I think, 60, so basically still of employment age there were in Michigan that were not working as teachers, and there were 100,000. Teachers, they're just not teaching. Right. <laughs> and that's not to say they're not in the field of education, because I am one of those people. Right. Right, right. 
Anyone else have comments? No, let me just say, though, I, yeah, I do. Let me just say that uh, if, if things are so bad that they're closing and it's hard getting teachers, then nobody's going to open a new school. <laughs> so the only reason they would is if they have a model that maybe reduces the cost, maybe that's more, maybe less overhead and more variable costs, or maybe there's, you know, I, I don't know that there's a real concern that things are going to collapse into the wild, wild west. I mean, there are standards, or we just looked at standards. So, I mean, you know, it's just going to, um, I, I don't know, I, I don't see any downside, quite frankly, to opening it up. And um, I know I might be in the minority, but, you know, I just, I really can't, I don't know, I just can't see that uh, if it's that bad and everybody's closing, nobody's going to open it up. The only reason they would is if they think they can tailor themselves to the customer, a potential teacher, better than anybody else. And I think that's worth trying. And I, and I think what I heard Vanessa say is it's not about um, the moratorium is not about the retention or the attraction of teachers. It's about the department's ability to support. But I think initially she said that was the reason was the teacher, you know, that we had uh, overabundance of teachers was the region, original reason for it. That was the original um, reason back, I, in, I've gotta back believe, in 2005. I've got to believe they can find the resources. I, I mean, it, we're talking about one, maybe two. I mean, they just said several close. So what, they have extra capacity in it? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Okay. I think it would be a good thing to legislature could give them a little bit extra money if they really, if they are, are tight to the bone and they just can't find any money to. Well, I, I think you answered answer my question because I, I wanted to go back to what the intent of this, this moratorium. And I think you answered my question and you did too. So I'm in support of it. Okay. Thank you. Lupe? I'm sorry, Pam. Back. Sorry, Pam. Uh, <laughs> I'm number two. <laughs> it can't be two. <laughs> um, so, and I can't exactly remember where we started off on the conversation, Cassandra, where you were saying that it would be some altered selective moratorium. Well, I guess for me, in all of this conversation that we're having in the last two questions that were raised, I would really prefer to scratch it and to start all over again, because I don't feel comfortable signing on to something that says moratorium on educator preparation institutions and then talking about how there are too many teachers. I would rather us, uh, I don't know, something else that gets at the crux of what's what we're talking about now. I mean, we get to the same outcome, but I don't feel comfortable with anything appearing as if I believe that there's too many teachers that are that are in Michigan because we're talking about the Upper Peninsula, but you go up and down the 75 corridor, and once again, we're, it's again the house is on fire. So I hear you say having a different motion rather than yes, the one that we you. have. Yeah, thank you, and Dr. Z. I would suggest. Uh, in view of the support that several have voiced for the three-month moratorium, I move that we substitute uh, the three-month moratorium uh, with the expectation the department will report back and uh, will reconsider it um, <coughs> in another three months. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, I read the motions. Someone. Lupe did. Yeah. For yeah, 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 right, right, right. Yes. Lupe made the motion, and I had Eileen seconding it. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Would you guys so we had a discussion. Support that, um, either the I, 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 or, I don't or should we just vote it down and start over? Maybe voting it down and starting okay. over. That's just, my recommendation that's pretty, would be right. be cleaner. Okay. okay. Can you withdraw your motion then. I, I can with if it, it dies for lack of a second. There you mm -hmm. go. So those in favor of the original motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Nay. Okay. Motion fails. So now we will have a new motion. Dr. Z. <laughs> I move that we um, adopt a three-month moratorium and then hear back from the department as to the recommendations going forward. Support. We're extending it from October 13th. From October 13th. 
Yes, we would extend that. it then through. And I'm open to me. six months or whatever you think you need for maybe, and maybe this should arrive on the desk of our new superintendent. I don't know. Well, that would put us at July 1st. Next year. About. Okay. Lupe? So, to the chair, is that a good recommendation? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, with respect, the, if you are willing to give us more time to work this into our very heavy work schedule, we will have a better recommendation. The longer you give us, the more thorough our recommendation, the more we can engage stakeholders, the more we can look at our data. So six it's months, kind of maybe? six months would be nicer than three. Longer than six. Nine months would be better than six and would take <laughs> us to the next state superintendent. That is a good point, Dr. Ziley. Um, again, we want to be responsive to the board, and the team is amazing, and they do get um, blood from the stone all the time. That being said, <laughs> every time we have to move quicker on something, something waits. And some of our more strategic, less urgent priorities will sit while we work on something that's possibly less strategic. This might be less strategic, but now more urgent. So again, we're like, I, I would love a year moratorium if you're willing to entertain that. Um, if, if that's too long, then you know we we defer to the board and their their willingness to grant us time, because we would like to come back with. We understand what you don't want us to come back with is extend the moratorium. You want us to come back with some modified, selective, or possibly some more data to prove more conclusively why a moratorium is absolutely the right piece. And I hear you also saying that the original intent of the moratorium. 15 years ago or 10 years ago about oversupply of teachers is not a valid reason now, which we concur with. Our reason bringing it back was not about we have too many teachers. We, the department does not think we have too many teachers. I don't want, I want to, no, sorry, let's not press in the room, but just on record. We do think that we have, we, we, again, our re reason is around technical assistance and capacity to support the development paths we have. That being said, the board has rejected that motion. So when we come back to you, we know we need to come back with not simply extend the moratorium, but come back with a more nuanced or uh, more data to support the original. So again, leave it to the board to recommend a, a time. Cloning would be good too. Also so, cloning. <laughs> okay. uh, is there another word that you can use instead of moratorium so I understand this better? Um, What's another word? A hold? A hold? hold or Cessation from approving new providers. I'm sorry? Cessation from approving new providers? Cessation. So it, was that your original <laughs> intent? Just to stop it. For, uh, yeah. You were trying to stop it in first place? So, The yes. original motion. So back when it first happened several ten years ago, we none of us were here, I don't believe. No. I was, was in teacher here. prep. Sean was in, in the teacher department. prep. Um, <laughs> They brought it forward and said, we have too many teachers. We don't need more programs, moratorium. We have renewed it twice okay, now. Okay. This would be the, the second renewal. Second uh, this board renewed it in 2015. Yeah. Well, some of this board. Um, at that point, it was, again, about what? technical assistance, not so much about shortage, but about technical assistance. We continue, So we continue to say we appreciate the moratorium to allow us to focus on quality of who we have. So that was our intent bringing it forward this time. This is now the third time you, the, this board has, or a board, the Board of Education has considered this moratorium. I mean, if you put something like enhancing EPI uh, number or monitor and support for quality or something like that, and then within that you are ceasing, I don't know. Well, but I, that's, I mean, you're, you all are going to probably vote on extending for three months, and then you'll have time to think that through. But. Or the question is, the question is right now, do we put a hold on a moratorium if three months, six months, if we do 10 months, it gets us to, um, if we do nine months, it gets us to July when we don't have a board meeting. If we do 10 months, it gets us to August, and that would probably be the su new superintendent's first board meeting. If you did a year, it would get, get it to yeah, this more to oct October more of 2019. But now we have a whole year where, once again, we're treating alternative certification routes completely differently than we are traditional. And that's one of my, my concerns. If this is such an important thing, then it should be important for everybody. Yeah, I don't, 
I don't see any reason to wait for so long. We can change it later, but I, I just, uh, this new superintendent here for a month isn't going to be able to eight people on a board that it's our responsibility to either extend this or not. So my original motion was three months. Was three months. Mm -hmm. Who seconded? I did. Okay. So we can proceed then. then and, no and but Jay, I want to okay. substitute your motion to say at least six months because they're even requesting a year. And this is not a Mickey Mouse job. This is, takes a long time to put together. So they need the time. So if we're going to vote this down and then we give them three months, they need more. They're requesting more than three months. I'm willing to Are you willing to amend your friendly. motion to yeah. six months? At least Dr. six. Z? Yes. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Let me make sure. Go ahead, Ms. No, no, no. I was just going to add just something that Tom said. I mean, I think there's, I'm just trying to think there's ways to reconcile all these concerns. Um, so in, in making a proposal, if, if it's a modified uh, one, if if uh, someone puts forward something that's unique and is seems like it's it's sort of a a different approach, a different institution puts together something um, that really seems worth the effort for the department. Um, I think that that's would be acceptable rather than just having someone, you know throw it throw it out there and maybe it's not a viable option or maybe it's not going to be sustainable um so something that's like alternative right but it would be from a regular institution and i would love i mean is there a law that says we have to treat the alternatives differently is there that some sort of a yes i i would like to make not a recommendation in terms of the moratorium mm -hmm. but in their approval process yes right so there's a law on that well i would like to well, then maybe make the a traditional little... should follow that same process then. Yeah, I got, I think I understand that what you're saying. Um, I just, uh, I just see a lot of, you know, like when we have an oversupply of schools, it's a structural problem um, because then the resources, instead of being concentrated to be effective, become diluted and less effective. So that's, so that's also a concern. Um, when we have limited funds to do uh, to do things, so I, I I just wish there was a way to treat everybody uh, in a way that ensures quality. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just want to be clear on the motion. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. So you are uh, saying three months hold. On the moratorium, or three months extension six, of the moratorium? I mean, six, six months, months extension. Six six months months extension. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. Six months. I thought it was extension. Yeah, so right. it's recommended the State Board of Education okay. approve a six month extension. Thank you. Okay. On the new educator preparation gotcha. institution approval. Right. Period. Okay. So we have motion, we have it second. Is there any more discussion? Okay. Well, I'll take a all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Okay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the State Board of... Oh, thank you to thank you. Vanessa yes. and Leah and Sean. Thank you very much for being here. The approval of the State Board of Education meeting schedule for 2019. Um, we have a proposed meeting schedule for 2019. The regular meetings are scheduled for the second Tuesday of each month, and the board's retreat is scheduled for the fourth Wednesday in May. The board is being asked to approve the 2019 State Board of Education meeting schedule today. Motion, please. So moved. Second. Support. Any discussion? Can you check this with the holiday calendars? Yes. Any other discussion? <laughs> okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. The next item on today's agenda is the state and federal legislative update. Marty Ackley, our Director of Public and Governmental Affairs, will lead the state and federal legislative update. Marty, welcome to the board table. Good afternoon. As usual, you saved uh, the balls for last. So I appreciate that. Uh, the, the legislature was in session this week and now is going to be out till the end of the month. 
But the House Committee on Education Reform did meet um, this week and took testimony on several bills. Among them was a bill, House Bill 5707, that would retain the percentage of a student's growth and assessment data measure on the state assessment at 25% to be used for Eddie Val's educator evaluations, which current law has going up to 40% this year. So this would keep it at 25%. Uh, other legislation discussed was House Bill 6314, which would codify a public innovation district designation and it created a commission to take appeals of districts that have applied to become innovation districts but had been denied. Now, MDE has an innovation council um, and been in place for several years uh, that consists of MDE staff, local superintendents, retired superintendents, charter school representation, and ISD auditors. That council works with local districts on their ideas for innovation and provides support and guidance on how they can get to where they want to be within state and federal laws. Um, so the, the commission that would be created uh, would be able to take appeals if a district had been denied um, uh, innovation district designation by that council um, and by the superintendent. Um, MDE staff is currently going through this legislation. It's quite um, detailed and at the same time it's vague in places, um, but we're going through the legislation to assess the impact that it would have if it was enacted. Uh, so there's that legislation. Again, it was taken only for testimony um, there, is, there is no um, next House Education Reform Committee scheduled at this time. The legislature is back at the end of the month. So I'm not sure what the plan is for that bill. It's a two bill uh, set. And uh, finally, at the August State Board meeting, it was brought up that the board uh, worked to establish and advocate a set of legislative priorities. And I'd like to defer now to Cassandra to discuss that further. Well, uh not a whole lot to necessarily um, just say. We talked about, a, you know, we have a new, we're going to have a new legis group of legislators come in. We're going to have a new governor, new state leadership. Um, so I think the idea was it would be good if we started working on kind of what, what are our legislative uh, and executive priorities as a, the State Board of Education so that um, at the time that there is some changeover at the state, uh, we have some specific things that we might want to advocate. Um, and, and rather than simply react every time the legislature comes up with something or the governor comes up with something, to have our own set of priorities that we can say these are the things that we think are really necessary if we want to move the needle. So I just wanted to kind of open up the, the conversation. Before we had had kind of a chicken and egg conversation about does the legislative committee come up with this and bring it to the board or does the board come up with it and bring it to the legislative committee? And I think um, Eileen's point was well taken that uh, for transparency's sake, it probably makes more sense to have the conversation at the board level. And then if there are specific things that we want to look at, we can uh, ask the legislative committee to do a little deeper dive into that and maybe come up with some um, criteria or specifics along those lines. So I just wanted to open up. I don't think we have to make any decisions today, but something that we should probably think about, and if there are any specific things that we want to yeah. move forward. I, I, following up on the last conversation, I'd say teacher retention and support. I guess, would it make more sense to do this after November? Mm -hmm. It, I, I mean, I, I love the uh, yeah the idea, and I like not being always reactionary. So I love what you're going towards. And I think we talked about you know the, the luncheon that we had with the legislators and stuff. But no, I like this idea. I just uh, I think there's going to be a lot of bipartisan uh, ideas, but there also could be none. And so before we start <laughs> wrangling for the next couple of months, maybe <laughs> <laughs> or appear to be wrangling, I don't know. I, th I, I agree with you. I think it's a little premature, but I, I also wanted to just kind of introduce the topic so that as we move closer to that date, we're kind of thinking of some things that, um, you know, we're a 4-4 board right now, so if there's things that we agree on, I would say that's probably a good direction to head mm -hmm. in. <laughs> um, either way, so... Any other comments? Well, I had I had a and it's sort of a reactionary. Um, so, the, the in one of the board briefs, there was this discussion about what is it? Id? 
Yeah. So what, what you had just mentioned, the, the House bill that creates the Innovation District? Yes. Right. Um, so I, I mean, I, I still have lots of questions around it. And, um, and I, I, uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what it is. And the purpose of it, although I do see in the, the notes that it would circumvent the requirement for cybers to have that uh, hour of teaching. I don't know if that has anything to do with the legislation being proposed. But um, I, uh, it, it raised a lot of red flags. And um, I think, anyway, I, I don't know if there's anything more that you have to say on it or... Um, but if on list of things to discuss, not only the legislation, but what is the impetus? Why? Why? Can I just read this? Yeah. This, this is uh, 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 Sheila's analysis of it. Uh, well, this one paragraph. A PID would be allowed to operate a year-round program, design courses based on the interests of individual pupils, utilize community experts in the educational process, and adopt and implement an alternative assessment of pupil progress that meets the requirements of ESSA. A PID also would be allowed to offer extended learning opportunities if the opportunities and a mandated policy on extended learning both meet prescribed requirements in the bill. An extended learning opportunity would mean a learning program that occurs outside of a school setting. So if, if it has, has the department done a formal analysis, because this is not in our usual format, and I don't know if right. that's a product that you Th can find. Right. What, what Sheila provided in the board briefs was a summary of the concepts in the bill. Uh -huh. um, there's a lot of detail in the bill um, that we are, like I said, we've shared it amongst the Department of Education to assess the impact if this bill were be to enacted, to be enacted. Um, but there are red flags. Um, there are good things that, that could happen with this, but there are things in the bill as written now uh, that would be problematic that we are that we are concerned about. Yeah. So, so has the bill been dropped or is it in committee? Yes, it's, it's been dropped. It's, it's been introduced and I had a okay. committee hearing uh, this week. Okay. And are you doing, are you in triage? Are you yes. negotiating? So well, at, we are in triage. We are, we are Reviewing the bill and assessing the impact if the bill would be to be it would be enacted. But this is, as what, this is. is what the repercussions are. Right. So when uh, how fluid is this? Do you get the sense that it's on a quick passage path or? Is it um, it's unclear at this time because I, um, as I mentioned, there is no next House Education Committee meeting right. scheduled. Um, they don't come back into session okay. until the twenty fifth of September, I think. Um, so. So we're not in a position at this point to give an analysis to the committee and the board for October? We're developing a fuller analysis Excellent. now. Also, um, we have requested a meeting with um, legislators to be able to discuss what the issues are um, that led to what the impetus was that led to this bill, to this House bill. So we've requested a meeting to have some discussion around it. Who introduced the bill? Representative Kelly. Well, who's also the chair of the committee. Yeah, that makes me think it's going to go somewhere. Um, yeah. What, could, what is a, is it a school district? Is it another EAA? Is what, what is it? Well, districts right now through the, through our current existing innovation council, they can come to the council and say, I've got this great innovative idea and we're all for innovation. I mean, we've been doing um, innovative ideas um, since former superintendent Mike Flanagan was, was here and we had Project Reimagine, um, which was many years ago, which has continued and now it's become an innovation council, where districts would come here with an innovative idea. We would look at it. We would work with the district and say, you know, you can do this already or this is how you can do this, working again within the, within the constructs of state and federal law. So we do this now. And I think one of the issues is, is that there may have been a district that wasn't, that got denied by this council, and so they went to Representative Kelly and said, we need a way to appeal that process. Do you think it was the cybers? No. No. No, with the, the 12, the no. 10,000, no, or the 1,000, whatever no. hours. I, sorry, I, but it's possible. I'm just checking right now to see whether um, House TV has the tape, because a lot of, I, I watched part of it. I was interrupted. That's why I can't give you a better description of this, but... The conversation was broader ranging than something that alarmed me. Uh, it sounded like it was something that the um, could be of use to any school that was doing Marshall Plan. I could be wrong on that. 
Um, we haven't worked with him on this in the context of the market. So you don't know. Yeah, we don't know. But I think if, if people were concerned were to watch that segment, we would be in a better shape for worries, and uh, we, could, we could focus the concerns that we've got a little more clearly. It doesn't mean that the conversation in a John Austin word was wholesome enough to indicate all of the possibilities, <laughs> but it, it was a pretty complete conversation. Right, right. I want to shove down our throats really fast. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why that's why <laughs> watching the watching the hearing might be of help. Yeah, but you know, but we also, only I, meet once a month. I'm just curious the alternative assessment. I mean, doesn't that put us in <coughs> violation of ESSA? Not necessarily, because remember that they said that we could be doing portfolio. I I think I've tossed my notes, but the um, uh, the uh, portfolios extended performance tasks. So if the, uh, and, um, ooh, help me out here, the New England states have a consortium that has put together, I think, um, uh, a competency-based, Vanessa's over there, um, they've tried to do this, and I think it's within the realm of, or it's, it, it was, it's something that ESSA allows. Uh, so, and, and there was a pilot uh, program for doing uh, non-conventional assessments, which Michigan didn't participate in. So there are avenues from other states that probably would work. I don't know whether um, Vanessa's over there being very quiet. So I will. <laughs> we come back to the board table. Um, <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so the the challenge with any sort of assessment that isn't the state assessment is uh, at least under federal <coughs> regulation and state federal regulation in particular, the ESSA flexibility. It still has to meet certain requirements and comparability with the state assessment. So in New Hampshire, for example, what they did is four districts, um, so note four districts um, in a state of like um, got together and came up with portfolio assessments, other forms of assessments, and they gave them parallel at the same time with the state assessment for a few years so they could show comparability, and then they eventually showed that they basically were measuring the same thing, and they used them. That is how the ESSA Innovative Assessment Pilot Authority is built and why we did not go in for it the first time because it was not at that time our assessment vision. We wanted not just the state system and an alternative system. We wanted um, the state system and maybe some districts being able to do a some variety of other Some things. different types of yes. innovative assessments. Right. When we weren't going to define this other little pot over here. U.S. had said no to that. So now we're back looking at a more... Um, cohesive uh, assessment system kind of built on the New Hampshire model and some other model about ways to assess student progress through other types of assessments um, that would be made available. So we are working on this outside of this bill. This is something we've long been interested in innovation and assessment and ways to have other measures of student learning. So we are looking at the flexibilities. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's a it's kind of a long answer to it's there's some allowability, but you there's a lot of steps to get there. It's not a it's not a flip the switch sort of deal. New Hampshire spent, I wanna say, oh, a solid five or six years on development before they were ever approved to use it. So it, it's a lot if we commit to it, it's a long road. And again, it's a dual testing for a while until you show that your system is comfortable. Well, I won't be on the state board of it. <laughs> Our loss. <laughs> and I can't find it on house head in the, uh, it could be the iPad format, but it's just not pulling it up. Oh, we're getting a link. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, back to my original issue. I, just think about what mm -hmm. legislative priorities sure. you might want and in the next month or two. We can kind of hash some of those wow. out. And yeah, we can start making our own list mm -hmm. and then exactly. bringing them to the table. Yep. Oh, here it is. And we'll put this back on a future agenda item. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay. It is, it is here. I, I, I just was searching in the wrong format, but it is these, the last Thursday's hearing is here on House Education TV. Okay. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you, Caroline, for sending us that link. All right. Comments? by State Board of Education members. Are there any board members who wish to offer comments this afternoon? Yeah, we, some of us got a correspondence from somebody in Tecumseh that said that uh, they recalled four of their school board members and the other three were up anyway. So all of their board is up because of uh, competency-based education and 
I think it was the pilot that has been out there uh, a little bit, but that it was implemented. Uh, I mean, it was just uh, a lot of computers uh, being introduced and kids on computers and uh, real problems. Um, and so they, to the extent that they recalled all their uh, all the members that were not going to be up this year. So there is some, uh, and, and they commended us for all of our questions. And I think at least going forward, uh, you know, and, and they said that there was no transparency. I kind of harken back to the Marshall Plan that's going to force districts to be advocates for something that has no evidence that it actually works. Um, and so, and it very well could be harmful. And so I, you know, just a little validation that they appreciated that uh, at least um, that there's some skepticism and that uh, as, it, as this goes into other districts that maybe parents that are going to push back are not alone, that there's, uh, you know, the board is uh, expressing skepticism and and that uh, it's you know may end up being a fad that uh, needs to go by the wayside any other comments okay hearing none um, from so yes sorry. Michelle um, I know we you want um, recommendations on the guidance but um, in looking at it I just wanted to say um, I was hoping that there'd be a little bit more explicit um, uh, guidance on including um, people with disabilities uh, in there, uh, in in uh, incorporating them. Because I know, like for instance, with the CTE programs, we've asked for, you know, even though students are accommodated, the curriculum is often not modified to meet their needs, and they're just left out of the CTE. So these opportunities that um, might come. Uh, you know, I, I do share a, the overall view is I'm, I am very concerned about this all being digitized, digital, digitized, digitized, digitized um, education, which makes teachers less relevant. Um, that's my main concern. But if we're going to have a program to help people, um, I, I certainly don't, or supposedly to, uh, you know, advance opportunities, I don't want the opportunities um, to be limited to people who have, who have certain abilities and the people who desperately need help out. Okay. So if that could be included in the guidance as well. Okay. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else? Okay. Seeing none, then we'll go on to the next item, which is future meeting dates. The next. State Board of Education meeting will be held at Lenaway Intermediate School District in Adrian, Michigan. That's on Tuesday, October 9th. It is a regular meeting that will begin at 9.30 a.m. And as mentioned earlier, Lenaway ISD is one of our partners in our work to scale up multi-tiered system of support. And I know they were very excited to be able to share the progress of their partnership, their experiences with MDE, and the progress that they are making to scale up MTSS in several of the districts within their ISD. Um, following our, yes, Dr. Z? Sorry, is there a street address for the Lenaway ISD? We will get you a street address. Mm -hmm. We will be happy to send that to you. And for anybody that needs it, it'll be at the top of the agenda also. So. Okay, great. Thank you. And then our next meeting will be Tuesday, November 13th, 2018. That's a 9.30 meeting here in the Hanna Building. And then followed by Tuesday, December 11th, 2018, 9.30 regular meeting here at the Hanna Building. As a reminder to board members, if there are any specific items that you would like to see included on future agendas, please let us know. We'll be working the next few weeks to finalize agendas for next month's meeting. I also want to thank the board today for your engagement and your involvement and your really thoughtful and reflective questions and our rich discussion around some really complex agenda items today. So thank you so much for um, your very active participation. I greatly appreciate it. And with that, I would say have a safe travels to back. Adjourn. And motion, motion to adjourn. Be supported. Board.